What company policy at your job might actually be illegal? One of the sales jobs I used to have, if you did not meet a quota you were fired, as it is with most sales jobs. Thing is my buddy who was let go was forced to sign this paper that basically said they warned you if you did not meet a quota you would be fired he signed. They let him go. Signing that paper on the way out basically faked him and he could not get unemployment because he signed a paper that said they warned him in advance which they did not. I had a slow month shortly after and they let me go and I knew the paper was coming and I obviously refused to sign. The two managers basically had a panic attack and said I had to sign it. My exact response what are you gonna do? Fire me if I don't. And I left. My manager chased me out of the building trying to rescind the firing. My guess is they did not want to pay the fines they would get for having a former employee apply for unemployment. Edit spelling edit too lol wow of all reddit posts I have this one semi blows up. Yes I filled for unemployment, was on it for about 2 weeks, before I found another job. Name of the company is Solar City, which I'm pretty sure is no longer in business. I place that I used to work for did something that's 100% illegal. Illinois has a unique law requiring companies to inform employees how their biometric data is to be used, stored, and deleted after they quit prior to collecting it from the employee. This company collected everyone's fingerprints for the new fingerprint reading time clocks, but they never bothered to inform the employees about the previously mentioned info and obtain their consent. Someone, not me, brought up how this is required by law and how the company was breaking it. He refused to do so until they went through the proper process. After they did what was required by law he'd consent to them collecting his fingerprint. The company treated him like a troublemaker and only acquiesced to doing what was required by law after him standing his ground for a month. But for every other single employee the company illegally collected their biometric data in the form of a fingerprint. Here's the law in question. 740 ILCS 14 slash Biometric Information Privacy Act. The last job I worked at was a school. We had part year, teachers, and year round employees, operations staff, but the year round employees technically got PTO hours that were equivalent to the time the part year employees had off, something like 350 hours. We weren't allowed to use our PTO hours and they were just converted and paid out as a bonus at the end of the summer. I was the it person and was a year round employee. We had some leadership changes and I put in two months notice because I didn't like where the school and its leadership were headed, but I wanted to give them time to find and train a new person before I left. I had about 200 hours of accrued PTO at that time. The school network tried to fack me and said that I would just lose those PTO hours when I quit. Apparently I was the first person to question that and fight them on it. Eventually they caved and kept me on the payroll for a month and a half after I left because they didn't have a system for paying out PTO mid-year. The turnover rate was really high, 60 something people quit just at my school in the 3 years I was working there. There were only 1 or 2 people left from the original staff after 5 years at another school in the network. And I was the first person to get a PTO payout. When I was 15, I worked at a fast food restaurant. The laws in my area didn't allow me to work past 8 o'clock in the evening because of my age. My shift managers would force me to clean the bathrooms after my 3 8 p.m. shift was over. If I didn't clock out before 8, they would change my clock out time with their managerial privileges to make it seem like I had left at the proper time. I didn't get paid for the extra time I spent cleaning bathrooms. Others have already mentioned this, but talking about pay rates was highly frowned upon in that particular restaurant. I worked there for two years while making barely above minimum wage, and I didn't even realize that my rate was so low until I mentioned it to my new better shift managers. One last incident was that one of my shift managers sexually harassed me when I was 15. I told my boss, and she was horrified, but the higher ups dismissed the issue. That sick shift manager quit shortly thereafter. Edit. Clarified first paragraph. Worked at a law firm. Attorneys were salary and support staff was hourly. They required all employees to clock out any time they went to the restroom. Attorneys didn't care because they were salary. 
support staff didn't object because they didn't want to risk the jobs. Young female attorney starts. They of course don't mention that during the interview process. Orientation they mention it and she laughs because she thinks they're joking. Within a couple of weeks ours approaches her because we noticed you're not clocking out for your restroom breaks. She tries to explain very calmly that one, it's illegal and two, what's the point, sh salary. They keep insisting that she has two. All of a sudden she bellows you don't need to know how long my sheets take. They didn't bother her again. Edit, the icing on the cake. It was an employment law firm, so yeah. Edit 2. 9 out of 10 times ours is not there to help you. They are there to limit the company's liability. They are not there to help you with a grievance. The following story occurred at a former workplace, but the end result wound up being included in a class action lawsuit against the company by which I was employed. Over the summer between my sophomore and junior years of college, I got staff to work as a secure document processing specialist through a temporary placement agency. While that may sound like a position with some level of excitement or intrigue, it sadly suffered from the same issue that so many such jobs do, namely, that a remarkably dull and mundane task had been given an interesting name. My mission, in short, was to take old workers' compensation files, scan the barcode on them, and then type a six-digit number into a database. The arduous task would indicate that the document had been destroyed, at which point the item in question would be placed into a container for future shredding. That was it. That was the whole job. Although my dreams of becoming an entry-level spy had all but died, when I'd initially walked into the cramped office full of outdated computers, they were well and truly crushed by the time that I'd finished my first four hours of employment there. About the only form of entertainment that we had was a dilapidated radio, which seemed to have contracted a bizarre form of static-based whooping cough, and the only in-office sustenance that was offered came from the bowels of a gargantuan machine which purported itself to provide a selection of either coffee, tea, or, in all seriousness, chicken soup. Not that it mattered which button you pushed, mind you, because the mechanical behemoth would always shudder, whine, and then spurt out the same vaguely yellow liquid that could very well have been an industrial lubricant of some kind. You might think that I got fired for attempting to amuse myself by reading through the various legal claims, and while my coworkers and I did occasionally see a few of them, purely by accident, I assure you, the truth was far more farcical. See, after working in that office for a little over a day, I discovered that my barcode reader could be used both for scanning the files to be destroyed, and for marking them as such. I didn't even need to touch my computer, except on those occasions, when an air in space or something had been accidentally entered. Thus, using no more than a desk lamp and a few creatively placed rubber bands, I managed to devise a mostly automated means of doing my job. With this system in place, the only thing required of me was to grab a stack of file folders, arrange them beneath the scanner, so that the laser would fall on their barcodes, and start pulling them away, one by one. I showed my setup to the other people in the office, and suddenly, our work output went up exponentially. A job that was slated to last more than a month was suddenly finished in less than half of that time, and I was certain that I'd receive some kind of commendation for my ingenuity. Unfortunately, I'd forgotten one important detail, I wasn't employed by the company for which I'd been working, I was employed by a temporary placement agency. Those agencies, if you're not aware, make their money by staffing out employees, and a short-end job meant less time with those employees in rotation, which translates to less money for the agency. I'd certainly saved someone a fair chunk of change, but not the right someone. When it came time for my end of job report to the agency in question, I was summarily fired. Their reason was that I had failed to remain present until the scheduled end of the contract. TLDR. Efficiency effectively ends employment. I worked four years at Better Buy, a popular electronics giant in the US, and a very common practice at this place is to hire part-time employees and give them full-time hours. Another very common practice is to push employees to quit by different tactics. Examples would be cutting their hours to one day a week, then one for two weeks, and slowly take them to a month until they quit. 
Another example is constantly being checked on performance and nitpicking to force a quit or targeting them for minutes of tardiness to write them up and apply pressure. Purpose of this, from what I was told by the GM and all managers under, is that Better Buy has to pay about 1 to K a pop for employees that get canned for legal reasons or so. Those force push tactics are used for employees that managers don't like, are performing well but not overachieving, and employees who have lawyer friends and families. I had a good three and one half years in that place before I climbed in my career in the dork group. I loved that job, but there was definitely shady sheet going on everywhere. UK here and there were quite a few things that the restaurant that I worked for did that were almost certainly illegal. Having people in the kitchen work multiple 14 hour shifts in a row, such as a 12 pm to 2 am shift followed by a 7 am to 9 pm shift, not giving people their breaks. Since I was 16, when I worked there I should have had a break for each 4 hours that I worked, but would regularly have to do 7, 8 hour shifts on my feet with no break. Some others would have one 30 minute break, even if they worked through both lunch and dinner, 12 pm till 11 pm shift for example. Hiring people as apprentices to get around paying the minimum wage, £3.50 instead of around £6.50, and also making them entirely dependent on the restaurant. Not allowing one of the chefs that had infected tonsils dripping with pus, and who could barely stand up to go home, or she would be fired. The regional manager also told us to use an oven that had been condemned due to being unsafe, but also said that if an inspector came in then we had to unplug the obviously dangerously heavy and ridiculously hot industrial oven and carry it down to the basement and hide it. There were rumors, nothing anybody could prove, that the previous general manager would disregard our clock in and clock out times and just make up hours to avoid having to pay people. They would also regularly understaff every area of the restaurant which meant we would regularly have up to an hour's wait on starters for people that had booked tables at least a couple of weeks in advance to eat in our premium restaurant. Needless to say the staff turnover rate was quite high. The accounting firm I used to work for paid our interns time and a half for any hours worked over 40 slash week because doing so is required by law. The twist is that the interns were technically paid on a weekly rate, not an hourly rate, say $800 a week instead of $20 a hour. Therefore the firm's position was that the interns were already getting their base pay, time in the form of the $800, so they were only paid half for extra hours. The real kick in the teeth is that for each extra hour that you work at an $800 a week base, your hourly rate naturally goes down. This means that you were paid slightly less for every hour you worked after 40 hours. After 40 hours your hourly rate is $20 a hour, dollar sign 800 slash 40, so you get paid an extra $10 for the 41st hour. After 60 hours, your hourly rate is $13.33, dollar sign 800 slash 60, so you get paid an extra $6.67 for the 61st hour. After 80 hours, your hourly rate is $10, so you get paid an extra $5 for the 81st hour. Of course, this is how I was paid when I was an intern. Then my state specifically outlawed it, and when I was a first and second year staff I got to make less money than the interns. I don't miss public accounting. My company did something illegal, but I fixed their problem beforehand. Essentially, I broke my arm at work, and the doctor prescribed narcotic painkillers to aid the healing. The doctor wrote me a note saying that I could do no work while on the pills. The hours rep told me to stop taking the pills and get to work, and told me that any day I miss is now unexcused. I told her this was straight illegal, and she said no, because those meds, though prescribed, were being voluntarily taken. I told the workers comp insurance that my work was doing this and basically to expect a lawsuit and she immediately called my hours and straightened them out. I got an apology call that day and she basically begged me to forgive her. I did. The nurse that was assigned to watch and report on my progress, however, then instructed I stop taking them. Yeah, if you ever want to see a nurse sheet a brick, watch them tell a surgeon that they told their patient to stop taking the meds they assigned. 
he ripped her very hard and threatened to go to the board and have her license pulled. Basically the narcotics help the healing process. Hours deliberately trumping up disciplinary charges to gross misconduct so that firing you is an option. This is used to thin out staff numbers. Here's an obfuscated, but real, example. Someone I knew was a month late paying his corporate credit card bill which was loaded with a very modest set of legitimate itemized business expenses due to a fuck up in the expenses process. Bowers had a misconduct charge of you paid your bill late and a gross misconduct charge of serious and deliberate misuse of corporate credit card for personal gain. Take a guess at what they charged him with, go on. The union were able to cite case law where an employee at a similar company got a six-figure payout at tribunal for the exact same thing and a senior manager squashed the charge later in the process. My employer also has no contractual core hours for any of its regular office-based staff and none of it is mentioned in any hours or official company policies. Yet they discipline people for unacceptable timekeeping when they arrive at 9.30am. I don't think that would fly in court either. I've had many shitty jobs. 1. I worked in healthcare, which admittedly had different rules for breaks and such, but they had a monthly staff meeting where all employees were required to be at. If you were not on shift that day, you were still required to come into work and go to this meeting for an hour. Not paid. 2. I was fired for making a claim on a major medical policy provided by the employer, known for big blue vests. Had to sue to resolve that one. 3. Worked for an employer that would send us home early during a shift, if it was quiet, then force us to come in later that week, if it got busy under the fear of being fired. It got to the point where the work schedule was basically non-existent. Duel had to step in on that one. 4. This one happened at the same company as Hash 3, but it didn't involve me directly. They went through and fired all people over 55 under the guise that they were eliminating positions to save money. Then they promoted younger people for less money for similar job titles, but exact same responsibility. It was a different position in each store, so for instance one store lost the operations manager due to this new policy, then would promote someone to her operations team leader with the same responsibilities, but for 30% less cost. However other stores would still have operations managers. I believe they did a class action on that one, but I'm not sure how far it got. 5. This one happened at a workplace, but after I left. The company policy was, if there was a fire in the store, little chain convenience store, you were not to call 9, double 1, you had to call the manager of the store instead. You would be fired instantly, if you called 911, before calling the manager. Sure enough, 19 year old girl saw the electrical panel start a fire, and called the manager. Manager didn't answer. Called again didn't answer. The place burned to the ground without the girl being able to notify the manager. She got fired for not calling 911. 6. I'm a professional rescuer certified in CPR for adult and child. I got this training from my workplace that was a care facility. See hash 1. This was required training. I was not allowed to perform CPR for any reason while in that care facility. There was at least a few times where I had to tell 911 I can't do CPR and them forcing me to go through and listen to the steps each time me having to refuse to do them. It was a fireable offense. Liability was what their issue was, but then why teach CPR in the first place? Posting the name, because they deserve to be publicly shamed I worked at Logan's Roadhouse for a year and a half. I did everything from hosting to serving to busing by far the worst job ever. Absolutely disgusting and unsanitary. Floors were covered in a half an inch of baked on grease. All the trays for bread had black stuff burned in that was an inch deep. I found a 8 foot x 6 in x 1 inch chunk of coagulated black mold and dust bunnies and dirt. The soda fountains had mold in them. The freezer where you could pick your own steak leaked refrigerant onto the meat. I'm a guy and I was constantly sexually harassed. Management did nothing. Once my manager cut an employee's belt loops because she wasn't wearing a belt, ruining the pants the policies though. Ridiculous. They changed my hours so that they paid me under minimum wage. Say I worked 8 hours in a day. They would change my clock punches and say I worked 4. They frequently changed the amount servers would tip so they had to pay them less in taxes. 
The final straw was when a customer, a priest, ironically, had a tiki it, and when I went to get change they ran out on a $50 or $60 tab. They ordered me to pay it, or my employment would be terminated. I quit a few days later, after talking to my aunt who is a lawyer. They have a national class action lawsuits against them, because all the other restaurants were doing it. I hope they run them dry fact them. Never eat there. Here's one that you might have actually seen for yourself. I used to work in the mobile gaming industry, which, as most folks are well aware, employs a number of excessively shady tactics in order to make profits. For instance, the titles released by most companies in the space are quite literally intended to be frustrating instead of fun, and there's no shortage of behind-the-scenes mockery of folks who have been duped into believing that they actually enjoy playing them. Still, that sadly isn't illegal, but the subscription services that some games included probably was. Here's how the whole thing would work. A given user could purchase in-game currency for real-world money, thus allowing them to pay for all of the allegedly optional content that was nonetheless a prerequisite for finishing the game before the sun goes out. However, if they so chose, that same user could sign up for the aforementioned subscription, which would automatically buy an additional amount of digital wealth at the start of every month. These deals were offered with all sorts of discounts and bonuses attached to them, with the hope being that people would excitedly mistake them for standard purchases, then either forget, or simply not know, to cancel them. Not that cancelling them was at all easy, mind you, because it couldn't be done from within the applications themselves. People who had been fleeced would need to work their way through a series of likely never before accessed menus, find the one place where the subscription was even mentioned, and undo the damage from there. Of course, that would just prompt the game to push another deal at them. In a way, it was the laziest form of highway robbery the world has ever seen. TLDR. Gullible gamers get gouged. During every annual performance evaluation, Silent Matt Canuck needs to get out in the community and volunteer in his free time so have you done this? What charities or volunteer work have you taken on since we said this in your last evaluation? Me, unrelated to this job, and during my own free time. I'm looking into it. Them, so that's a no. Me, that is a no. Them, well the point is to get out into the community and further promote the company and yourself. You know, just when you're done work here you can always just do a couple of hours of some kind of volunteer work before you go home. Me, so, am I being told what to do in my free time after work? Them, me, because it sounds like you're telling me what to do in my free time after work. Them, implications that I'm selfish and or unmotivated. Me, I already work a second job to make ends meet, and it's a very public job that gets me noticed in them. It doesn't matter, that's paid, that doesn't count. I want to see you do unpaid work. Me, and what? Log it, email you about it, blog about it. Whatever volunteer work I do, I don't believe in bragging about it from the rooftops. That kind of cheapens the act of charity don't you think? Them, well, next year. I'd like to see you volunteering for a few organizations. FFS. Used to work for a large restaurant chain, mid-2000s. They wanted to switch everyone over to automatic deposits into their accounts, instead of receiving paychecks every two weeks. Didn't have time to get to the bank in the weeks leading up to next pay. Day rolls around, and the GM tells me your check didn't come in, because everything is direct deposit now. As soon as I get the forms from the bank sent over, they'll send the money. Buddy of mine who was managing the next day looks in the safe for something else, and there's my check sitting in there. He handed it to me, and I made plans to quit as soon as possible. Waited until they were understaffed for a huge dinner rush, and walked out the back door 5 minutes before my shift started. Also reminds me of the time same place called everyone into a staff meeting on a Saturday, super early in the morning, like 5 or 6. Most of the staff were in their teens or 20s so were hungover and exhausted. They threw forms in front of us and basically said these aren't a big deal, just some new company policy. Everyone needs to sign or you won't have shifts here. I was obviously one of the few that read it because it waived our rights to breaks, waived our rights to leave after 8 hours, waived our rights to overtime and all kinds of other illegal bullshit. 
I just slipped mine in the completed pile that was being mailed back to corporate without signing. When they tried to tell me I had to work longer than my 8 hour shift without overtime, I laughed and pointed out I never signed it. They couldn't refuse me leaving. Idiots. We were a company specializing in compliance. Basically going on site to various clients and helping them stay in compliance with whatever laws regulate their industry. Which means that management is very well versed in how to technically stay on the right side of the law while towing the line. Everything that was written or said out loud was on the up and up, but there was a lot wink wink going on. But never explicitly. And never if you asked about it. Basically, they would assign you a myriad of tasks that ended up being impossible to complete unless you break some kind of rules. If you brought this up, they would tell you to never break the rules or the law, but you definitely need to get this done. If you say it's impossible, they counter that your Kawaka Dave gets it all done and never breaks the rules. Except that Dave breaks the rules all the damn time and they know he does, but they have plausible deniability and know that's how the work gets done, so they allow it. Oh and it's not just Dave, it's everyone else. You can rat on Dave, but Dave is good at covering his tracks and the company likes Dave so nothing comes of it anyway, but now you're a dog sheet rat in the eyes of your coworkers and management. While there is an argument to be made that that shouldn't matter, because you did the right thing, in the real world it does matter. It's a lot different to go to work every day, where you are well liked, and get along with everyone vs being a dog sheet rat. It sucks. You won't get fired or receive any real discipline because that could fall under retaliation laws. And like I said, they know how to toe the line really well. But there are plenty of ways to make your time at work miserable that aren't illegal and that is exactly what they do. Maybe your job description includes a particular task that really sucks, but you've been lucky and not had to do it for 6 months. Better believe you're going to be doing it now. It's not retaliation, because it's your job anyway. Want a specific time off? Nah, not this time. Work priorities don't allow it, but we can do another time that's super inconvenient for you. Were you pretty sure you were going to get that promotion? Yeah. Well Janet is getting it, because she's been here two months longer than you. Doesn't matter that she sucks at her job. And forget about ever getting a good reference. They may not be able to officially retaliate against you, but that doesn't mean they are required to say good things about you. And you may have gotten a good reference before, but not now that you're a whistleblower. Plausible deniability every step of the way. Some of the best of us here on Reddit may say, none of that matters, do what's right, document everything, and report them. But what if you aren't clean yourself? They love that. Hey go ahead and go home at noon today, but record your hours till 5, I'll sign off on it. Oh you can totally use your company card for that, I'll approve it. All kinds of things like that. Now you feel like you can't report anything or you're going to be in trouble too. Maybe you haven't been wearing your safety glasses or steel toed boots because you're lazy and management turns a blind eye. Then later something bigger seems unsafe, and you want to complain, but who are you to bring up a safety issue? You don't even wear your safety glasses. TSK TSK. Someone is sure to reply to this comment saying you should always be following the rules anyway, and regardless, report what is against the law, and that someone will be right. But in the real world, most people are just trying to get along, and get their paycheck and that is a fact on of hoops, to jump through to do the right thing. And if you did speak out or report, there is always a large possibility that nothing comes of it anyway. That's a lot of risk to put yourself in without any guarantee that it will even matter there is great incentive to just do what is easy, and the company knows that. And if you do report, and they do get in trouble, they just say oh my god, we had no idea. The manager that told employees to break the rules will certainly be fired. And they happily do fire them because they got caught and they like managers who don't get caught. Maybe they pay a fine or something, but this outcome is so infrequent that they really don't take any precautions to prevent it. Ah yes the thread that was literally made for me. I work at a small family owned business, so the owner does whatever she wants. The accountant was forced to forge the boss dead husband's signature. The other graphic artist was forced to forge official city documents. We don't get bereavement leave, even though it's in the handbook. Boss hires for her son, but discriminates in doing so. Women can't sell RVs. 
I want an older retired man. I had to do cold calls because I'm a woman. I'm a graphic designer. If she buys us food, she makes us pray over it and makes a different person say a prayer each time. This is in the front lobby and we are all in a circle holding hands. This is a print shop, not a religious organization. Also prayer before meetings. Brings up politics and bashes the side she doesn't agree with. Boss man did this too before dying. The interview was 15 minutes of job stuff, 2 hours and 45 minutes of bashing democrats and calling Obama a goddamn Muslim. Why I decided to work here I think man one of her companies we did stuff for had to go to federal court due to insurance and repo fraud and other rule breakings. Turns out I happened across the court document a few months before applying. Unsure if illegal, but the job was advertised as salary. It's not. Also unsure if illegal, but the job posting was for company A, the employment sheet was for company B, and the actual job was for company C. Check cutting she knowingly rents out property to people who are doing illegal things. Fires you for talking about your salary. Lies about a job opening to people from the halfway house because I don't want those kind of people representing our business. Not exactly a company policy, but I had an incident at work that I'm sure is shady as fuck. I posted this a long time ago on r slash FDA, but I'll post the story here. I used to work at one of the top pharmaceutical companies that is responsible for global delivering of products. Last summer in 2017 we had a flu vaccine client. We received pallets of tubs of vials. For anybody who doesn't know what this looks like. It's essentially a white tub with a nester inside of it with vials sitting in the nesters. My job was to take these tubs off the pallet and move them into sterile rooms. Once inside the rooms we took the platic bagging off each individual tub. Note each tub had a double layer of bagging. I received a pallet and I go to unload it and notice black mold and literal pools of water sitting on top of the pallet. I go and grab cap and they freak out. They start testing it, and we start looking around more, and out of almost 50 pallets 20, 35 of them all had black mold, or yellow staining from water damage. Each pallet holds 19,200 individual flu vaccines. The mold and water was able to penetrate through both plastic bags, and was in the tub itself. Turns out the warehouse these pallets sat in had a hole in the ceiling as well as the box truck it was transported in also had a hole in it as well. About 10 minutes later all the big wigs start coming down and Kat is telling them that we cannot fill these tubs. They look at it for maybe 10 minutes then decided to ignore Kat and sent the tubs in to be filled. My jaw hit the floor and I should have called the FDA immediately. This is a clear violation and I personally feel responsible for not speaking up because we may end up killing somebody. So yeah. TLDR. Our boss is at work. Forced us to make medicine with mold in them because they didn't want to lose the client. This drug is directed directly into your veins. If I was you I wouldn't get a flu vaccine. Not quite company policy, but I managed a restaurant that went under new ownership that turned out to be shady. As. Fact. They laid off my grams. No warning. No reason. When he filed for unemployment, they contested it and drug his name through the dirt. It went multiple layers up until they lost in court. They laid me off using the following words. Exact. Not a paraphrase. We are making organizational and structural changes. Effective immediately. We are eliminating your position. When I filed for unemployment, I was notified a month later that it was contested that I had been fired due to poor job performance. I had a lady from Texas Workforce Commission read to me over the phone multiple disciplinary retoops and an entire performance evaluation that never existed until I was gone. Each document was check marked employee refuses to sign. They are lost in court. In all, it was almost a dozen salaried managers that all had cheaty layoffs turned firings. They are lost every single one of them. Another manager got pregnant and they made her life hell when they found out trying to get her to quit. When she refused, they fabricated a theft and tried to pin it on her. She saw it coming and had copies of bank records that proved the theft never even happened. Another executive chef found out during his unemployment claim that it was being contested for sexual harassment. It was 100% bullshit, of course. But it wrecked him for a long time. 
This was the mid-90s. I was a programmer for a company that made commercial pharmacy software for mom and pop pharmacies. It kept track of your prescriptions, printed the labels for the bottle, checked the drug-to-drug -drug interaction so two doctors couldn't inadvertently kill you. Note that I was porting the program from a very very old programming language, P-System Pascal, to a new for the time language called Clarion. I was talking with one of the old programmers who was still there maintaining the old P-System app when he got a call from a customer complaining about a system message. Something about the maintenance file needed expansion. So I asked, this was about my fourth day at the company, what this was. He gets this sheepish look on his face and explains, every customer paid monthly maintenance to the company, something like $300. That was for the 24th of July 365 support. But the software was so well written that it almost never needed support. So the owner instructed the programmers to basically add a routine that on startup would check a text file for a certain date value. If the current date was after that date value, display a message that the maintenance file needed to be expanded. Then a programmer would remote in via Caniware and run this maintenance expander program. It's what programmers have sometimes called a Hollywood program. Did lots of sheet on the screen with lots of tetchy looking sheet flying by, but all it really did was pick a random date more than 120 days in the future and write that date into that start update file. Oh, and this fell outside of the maintenance contract. So the customers were charged $500 each time in 1994. To use an analogy, it would be like Comcast's DVR freezing up when you go to watch a program and having to call them to expand your TV storage every few months. Total scam. That company is no longer in business, BTW. The restaurant I quit a couple months ago did quite a bit. First off the owner wouldn't pay us overtime and one of the chefs at a different location had to sue to get his unpaid overtime. I didn't hit up very often, so I didn't press the issue and just padded my hours before leaving. I don't know if this is illegal, but the owner also wouldn't let us take tips on cards because it would add extra bookkeeping for him. Finally, we didn't have working ack for the entire retty of the time I was there. There was ack in the lobby, but not in the back or the kitchen. During heat waves in the summer it would reach 108 degrees outside, and it was 5, 10 degrees hotter inside the cooking area with open flame burners and griddle. One kid who had asthma frequently had attacks and actually fainted one time. The worst part of it is that the owner said that the ack wasn't working but it was. The controls were locked with a passcode, and after one particularly hot day we started fiddling with it and got it working. My next shift there, I came in to find the Pasco changed, and a dinky little plug-in fan slash heater slash ack unit instead. Like a $20 one. Bear in mind there was no exhaust port to the outside for a heat dump of any kind, so anyone who's learned thermodynamics knows that it is literally impossible for the fan to do anything to change the temperature of the room. Not positive, but I'm pretty sure forcing people to work in fast high stress and physical conditions in 115 degrees violates some labor code. Definitely wasn't sanitary for preparing food with all the sweat. Oh shit, where do I start? We have fake SSL lock images on our websites that do not have an SSL certificate. Creative team was forced to create the images, even though they protested it our sales team sells educational courses, but are pressured to imply that customers are making an investment. Reps say things, like you give me $500, and I can turn that into $30,000, trust me. RC a specialist in marketing conducted a DDoS attack to try to bury the competition and an unfavorable news article that revealed our sheety slash illegal pastime an hourly employee and received a negative mark on my annual review for not pursuing my professional growth. I explained that I was told to not spend my paid time doing any learning slash professional growth, but my boss told me I should have done it in my spare time. I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to withhold a pay raise from an hourly employee for not working and paid. Disclosures on our sites claim that third parties won't use customer information. Absolutely false. When a customer attempts to opt out of marketing emails, they receive a confirmation message, but remain opted in. Our satisfaction guaranteed refund policy has certain requirements that the customer must follow. 
the product only works on a Windows computer, and we require that the customer installs the program and uses it once. However, sales reps love to lie and say it works on a Mac, so once the customer buys, they're stuck. I worked at a nursing home this summer, and they did plenty of illegal stuff. They covered up a scabies outbreak. They covered up a case of shingles. They announced that we were no longer allowed to say the word understaffed. They made me work 8 hours solo in a memory care unit with 46 residents, 21 of whom need changes during the night and 12 of whom were awake when the other employees left me there alone. The supervisor who legally should have been there was too tired. They made me come in when I was so sick that standing upright left me winded, also they could have someone handling medicine. They told me I could leave when someone else trained on meds came in. But the person who was supposed to relieve me was pissed off and wouldn't count out narcotics with me, meaning that my options were stay or get framed for stealing narcotics. I eventually had to count out with an employee from another unit, which was illegal. The supervisor, who should have covered me, was too tired. I quit the day after that last one, and on Monday I start a course on medical law and ethics for my bachelors, and I will get to learn about all kinds of other ways they broke the law. I used to work at a company that pretty much everyone was hourly. I worked in it and had tons of art every paycheck cause we often did stuff after hours. Anyways we had new management takeover and one of their changes was moving us to salary. I was a little put off because this meant no more art but I figured it gave me more of an opportunity to enjoy more free time or balanced life and be closer to a 40 hour work week. Now keep in mind I wasn't in management. So one day I took off with the blessing of my boss and even his boss, however someone in ours had noticed I wasn't there, so they attempted to apply PTO for the day, even though I had worked the entire previous night. Something very close to 8 hours. So when I returned to work and noticed I asked hours, and I was told if I worked a 7 hour day I had to submit 1 hour PTO, or if I worked overnight and wasn't in what they detailed was a 8, 5 schedule, which was not at all accurate. Then I had to submit PTO. So essentially any time I worked that wasn't 8, 5 was not considered for anything. Pretty sure that is all illegal, especially considering I was not in management. But I also know labor laws surrounding salary work is a little weird too. I worked at a commonly known quick lube as my first job. I was 17 and graduated a semester early from high school to work full time. I took night classes at a community college that counted for my senior high school credits and towards my grad degree. I didn't leave high school early cause I was super smart. I left because of 2 DUI charges and possession of paraphernalia. The charges were dropped, and I wasn't spiraling out of control or anything, but I was a homecoming nominee. I had friends with parents well connected in the community. I grew up in an affluent area it was easier to remove myself from the spotlight that try and stay. Couple weeks into the job I realized how shady the owner was. He would sleep for hours with a tobacco pipe resting on his mouth. Only engaging when there was a problem or issue. Stealing became an issue. I met the wildest assortment of people. Deer heads crack heads and a few young kids at their first job. One person was in control of the register each shift. When cash was light at the end of the day. They had to answer for it with no process or accountability they could never prove who stole money. I'm friendly and outgoing and genuinely fascinated by the people I worked with. I was very confident in knowing who stole cash when it came up missing. This went on for a couple of months 60 bucks here 20 bucks there. One night I worked cashier. I went to check out a customer who was about to pay but had a question about the work done on his car. We went out to the vehicle and came back to finish the transaction. That might I was 60 short in my cash box. I told the GM and went home. Next day the boss told me that it was my responsibility and that he would replace it with cash from his pocket so that corporate wouldn't know. He told me he would deduct it from my next paycheck. I told him it wasn't me and that I wasn't going to pay. He assured me I had no say and I went home. On my walk home I called corporate to let them know that someone stole and it wasn't me. Next day the regional manager was in to check on the situation 15 years of running the place and the GM was escorted out. I don't know what's more disturbing. 
getting a man fired from a job that has provided for him for 15 years. Or knowing that for 15 years employees have been scared to stand up to his sheet and I was 17 years old. Two weeks later he showed up to clean stuff out of his office. He pulled me aside. Hey you owe me 64 covering the cash box. If you were a man you would pay me back. I told him I never stole the money. So I will never pay the money. Maybe you should have found who has been stealing from your 4 months. He called me chicken sheet and I never saw him again. It's a catch 20 to termination policy. Unless you are a mechanic or operator, you are not allowed to clean your own closer, a machine that packs the plastic forks and such into the boxes you buy at the store. It's prone to build up glue, however, you are also not allowed to call a mechanic or an operator, unless something actually breaks. But, the kit, the boxes I mentioned before, cost the company 12 cents each, and if you end up destroying too many, you can get written. So your choices sort of boil down to don't fix it and let the kid get ruined, thus getting a write up for it, or fix it your own damn self and if caught, get put on suspension for the first offense and fired on the second. The reason for this moronic policy? Some idiot put his fingers into a glue pot, which heats the glue pellets to 360, 420 degrees F, into a thick, burning, clinging liquid. From previous jobs, we don't pay overtime. After having worked overtime I had been called in for, including working a back shift and a day shift 6 hours apart. Make sure you sign and date the lockout tags and know the full lockout procedure in case you are asked during an inspection. Sign this form agreeing that you will be fired if you don't follow lockout procedures anywhere proper PPE. But don't actually do the lockout because it takes way too long. Also, we don't have all the PPE. To be fair, doing a full lockout for at least one of the machines I use is a ridiculous waste of time. Many redundant safety features, clear line of sight to plug and on switch and no one else with any reason to go near them. And I touch all the same parts while the machine is in use as intended as I do while cleaning it. My objection is to the discrepancy between what we are told to sign and what we are told to do and the shifting of blame. Listing butter but using margarine. Accepted a verbal offer job offer as a cook in remote oil camps that required me to pay my own way to the city their base of operations was in, before they'd put anything in writing. Yes, I was this stupid. When I arrived, they claimed they'd never offered the promised wage and that whoever I'd spoken to must have been mistaken, or their position started $4 slash hour lower than that. Had to accept, because I didn't have enough money to fly home. Also, they only offered contracts of one, three weeks duration, after which I was supposed to return to base camp for a minimum amount of time out of the bush before my next assignment. I was told accommodations between contracts were my own responsibility, but they would graciously allow us room and board at the base camp if no one else needed the room, so long as we cooked and cleaned for at least three hours a day unpaid while we were there. This wound up including catering the office staff's Christmas party, which contract staff were not permitted to attend. I used to work at an ice cream shop, and my boss would force us to take a lunch if we worked at least 5 hours, just so she didn't have to pay us for the 30. If our shift was 5 or more hours she would be watching us on the camera, call and tell us to take a lunch break, because we have to... I went and did some research about my state laws regarding lunch breaks and I read that you don't need to take a lunch break, but you can take a 10 minute paid break. So I started doing that instead because money. When my boss would call the store to remind me to take my break I just said okay thanks for reminding me. And I took a 10 and wrote it on my time card. At the end of the pay period I saw all of our time cards on her desk with mine on top and I noticed something funky. All of the 10 minute breaks I recorded were scribbled off and replaced with a 30 minimum lunch break. After seeing that, I went up to my boss with the time cards and ripped mine in front of her. JK. I just took it like a beach and didn't say anything. In my last job as a hotel receptionist I had no bathroom to use. I resorted to sneaking into empty rooms whenever I could. When I eventually had the privilege of a bathroom bestowed upon me, it was somehow worse than not having one at all. This toilet was in the hotel's basement and had a serious case of damp. The door was so swollen from the damp that it would not fit into its frame and subsequently didn't lock. 
you couldn't leave toilet paper in there because it would get soaked through. The worst bit was that the hotel was having work done, so there were builders everywhere. They'd leave the already disgusting toilet in some appalling states. I saw three builders dicks in the space of a week and got walked in on more times that I could count. I made a sign for the door but nobody could read apparently. It might sound a little dramatic, but I felt very unsafe because I was the only person in the hotel with these men with an unlocking bathroom in the basement. Years ago I worked at an insurance call center. You were required to be there 15 minutes before your shift and didn't get paid for that time. I kept every email from my boss saying as much as I was written up once for only being at my desk and ready to work 5 minutes before my shift started. Filed a complaint with the Department of Labor on my way out the door. They owed me back pay for an hour and 15 minutes x the number of weeks I worked there. They got back at me by withholding almost my entire final paycheck and a chunk of those back wages by saying that mandatory meetings I had attended constituted training and that I owed them for the professional training. I filed another complaint because they were saying, for example, that the training for my license cost $2,500. I sent the Department of Labor comparable training programs for the same license for $99 got my money back, but it took almost a year after I left. I also got this older woman I used to work next to calling me at home and screaming at me that I needed to stop antagonizing the place because it was a good place to work and my trouble making would make them close the place down and good people would lose good jobs. I told her, if the place closes, it isn't because of me, just that they found cheaper people to answer their phones and process their claims. The blind loyalty to sheet jobs and sheet companies saddens me. In a previous job, I was almost fired for being carl or blind, but I quit before it could happen. The scenario, I was given a work task that was color coded in a way that I couldn't see. When I informed my boss of my condition not refusing to do the work, but asking for accommodation she accused me of lying and wrote me up for insubordination. I then filed a complaint with ours, who told me that I could get the write-up removed from my record if I used our company's tuition reimbursement program to go take a remedial art class at our local community college. So you can finally learn your colors, they said. This happened right about the same time that I stayed late to cover for a diabetic coworker who had to run home to pick up an emergency refill for her insulin pump. When I got in. To work the next day, I was written up for the unauthorized overtime. I could have sued for either of those, but I decided to nope my way completely out of that environment. Previous resort island company I worked for allowed smokers to have a 8 minute break every 1.5 hours so they could smoke. I called out the manager on this policy because I, as a non-smoker, and other non-smoking staff weren't being given the same opportunity. His response was, but you don't need to have a cigarette break, you don't smoke. Well fuck me, Greg, god forbid I want to sit down for a minute after just serving 800 drinks to 200 people in an hour, yeah cunt. I bought it up every week at our staff meetings, eventually I was sick of his lack of response and action, so I took it to the higher ups of the island management and said I'd be filing a complaint with the fair work ombudsman in that state, if something wasn't done about it either make it policy for non-smokers to have the same breaks, or make the smokers only able to smoke on their half hour dinner break. They went with option 2. The smokers I worked with hates me for a long while, I didn't care, I hadn't done anything wrong. Greg could have avoided the whole issue by letting all of us have the same break privileges, but he wanted to be a cunt, so I played the bigger cunt care and ruined it for everyone. I never figured out whether this was actually illegal or not, but where I used to work, I was in charge of going through punch times and making sure everyone got paid. The first manager that was there when I got hired instructed me to print off a sheet listing an employee's punch times if they forgot one, either not punching in or out, and just fill it in for the whole day they were scheduled to ensure no missed pay. The employee would then sign it and fill in the time they were supposed to actually leave, and then it would be amended next week, either putting on more if they earned it or taking off some pay if they didn't work their full shift. Then, he got moved to another store, and the biggest cunt I've ever met in my life took his place. 
Apparently her policy involved withholding the pay of the entire shift should an in or out punch be missing. And not only would the poor employee not get paid, but instead of giving them the printed sheet directly like I used to, she specifically instructed me to leave all the sheets with her once my day was done, telling me that she would then speak to the individuals personally. Eventually people started coming up to me asking about big chunks of change missing from their paychecks, and I had to tell them that she had them, and that they needed to go to her office and talk to her to sort it out, because she wasn't actually seeking them out. No, she just let them go without pay until they got their woefully undersized paycheck and then complained to me about it. I questioned her lack of empathy for these poor people. What if they had bills to pay and because you wanted to be a beach for literally no reason other than that you could, you're landing these people in hot water. They have kids, families, rent, medical bills and make 10 times less than you while doing 10 times more work. Another big problem is that to finally get their missing money, they would have to forego the pay they had earned for basically two whole weeks. The first week, waiting for the botched paycheck to arrive, then waiting for the second week for my adjustment to kick in. This not only resulted in paranoid coworkers thinking management was trying to cheat them out of their hours, which they were, but it also resulted in doubling the amount of work I had to do, since I would have to wait an entire week to resolve issues from the prior week or weeks. I got so fed up with her absolute disrespect and her treatment of all the employees that after dozens more transgressions I just quit, but not until after informing my coworkers of her bullshit. Many of them responded by contacting union representatives, so hopefully something was rectified for them, but chances are they weren't, because nobody actually did anything ever when you needed something done. I haven't checked in on the place because of that beach, so I can only hope for the best. Edit, these events took place in the state of New York, so if any of you are versed enough in any US laws to know whether or not this method of withholding pay was actually illegal, I'd appreciate being informed. I love my current job, but I used to work at one of those dreamy indie movie coffee slash flower shops. My employer was a family friend and used this friendship to try and screw me out of a ton of money. I was scheduled every Wednesday for a 4am 1pm shift, but I often stayed late. The reason the shift started so early was because I had to drive with the owner to an out of state city to some flower markets to help her pick up flowers we needed for the shop and pastries slash bread for the cafe. I loved those shifts, I don't sleep much, so they worked really well and helped me do something productive with time I'd usually spend sitting awake and doing nothing well until I realized she wasn't intending to pay me for these scheduled shifts because she thought it was just our special girl time together. Lol. Fact no. I found this out because she had me tracking my own hours for the first couple months I worked there. So besides the fact she didn't even actually pay me for a couple months, I was a young teen living at home, I didn't need the income and had a second full time job. So I was cool with it at first, when I gave her my tracked hours she pulled the whole oh I'm not paying you for Wednesday's crap. What she didn't really count on is that I'm a loud mouth and I don't really take being walked on like that. I pointed out to her that if she ever wanted help on those shifts that only I was willing to work, I needed pay for them. Emphasize that as they were scheduled, she legally couldn't try to make it seem like they weren't work shifts. She paid me for them in the end, and I quit eventually, to receive a promotion at the other job I now work super full time at as a manager. I still have a fairly positive relationship with her, though she never apologized for what I feel was an intentional attempt at swindling me out of hundreds of dollars. I work at a large commercial art gallery selling very expensive artwork. The art business is shady for a multitude of reasons, but here are a few. If a client buys a piece and they live nearby, we deliver it to their home and have them provide an address outside of the state so that they can avoid thousands of dollars of sales tax. When shipping pieces internationally, the shipping department declares as little as possible for customs for much the same reason. If someone buys a painting that costs $150,000 and their country taxes 19% on fine art imports, we make a commercial invoice declaring something like $5,000, $950 in tax instead of $28,500. Their card will be charged twice. 
once with the lower value proving to customs that a credit card slip exists for that amount, and once for the balance. There are no price tags on the wall anywhere for good reason. Wealthy people like discounts, and are ironically extremely frugal and love negotiating. If a piece retails at $50,000 and I have maximum discount allowed of 20%, $40,000, it is always better to tell them that the piece is more expensive and give them a higher perceived discount during negotiations. In contemporary art, it is often said that a piece is one of a kind. While technically this is legally true, a work can be remade almost exactly and still be legally one of a kind. Buyers generally do not know this. It's common to sell a piece and have almost the same one hanging up next month. Software MVP minimum viable product hacker equals make it appear to work for the customer, so they will extend contract literally this. So point many point corners cut for MVP, it is disgusting. Technical debt. MVP. In other words, we don't care, we'll deal with, if we get new contract otherwise someone else problem. Found a bug? If customer has not cited it as a bug, leave it alone. Interesting note, product was just picked up from someone else giving it the same MVP treatment, and it did not work. Customer equals United States Department of Defense this company is being paid to fix something, and they are propping it up just enough to get the next bucket of money. Make sure contract only allows two weeks for customer to test product before accepting or not insufficient time given that users need to be trained, created, and so on. Your tax money, American, is paying for this sheet show and many others like it. I need a new job. I don't know if it is illegal, but maybe I can get some advice. My employer gives us 5 paid sick days per year, they are on a yearly schedule so, if you call out on the 14th of September 18 you get the occurrence removed on the 14th of September 19. It's worth mentioning that on the 6th call out you will receive a written warning. 7th is a 3 day suspension, and 8th is termination each after the 5th also may be termination. The issue I see, is that from my understanding where I live, California, the law states, that you cannot receive any type of occurrence for a paid sick day, so the occurrences, that we receive from the first 5th call out is illegal. 5 paid sick days a year is required in this state for all full time employees. If anyone has more info, or if I'm wrong somewhere please let me know. Labor Code Sections 233 and 234, if an employee has accrued and available sick leave and is using his or her accrued paid sick leave for a purpose as specified in the law, it is not permissible for an employer to give the employee an occurrence for the absence under such an attendance policy because this would constitute a form of discipline against an employee for using his or her paid sick leave as allowed under the paid sick leave law. A former DFW-based company I worked for insisted the manager and assistant manager work 6 days a week, 48 hours a week minimum, but you were clocked hourly by the quarter hour, and your stamp time card must equal exactly 48 hours. If you reported less, your pay was docked. If you reported more, you were fired. But we were called salaried. The math behind it was quite dizzying. It went a little like this, your pay stub was measured as. 40x dollar sign h plus 8x 1.5 dollar sign h equals weeks gross pay. The dollar sign h was your theoretical hourly rate. This was reverse engineered as 52x dollar sign w plus 8x dollar sign h per extra day. Since 52 weeks was only 364 days, so you had to make up an extra day or two on leap years. So why not just make it salaried and call it a day? Well. Forcing salaried workers to work 48 over 6 was not legal, and since each location was limited to 3 employees, the part-timer was only allowed 10 slash hours a week, 2 people had to work at least 6 days. So they claimed you voluntarily worked overtime, see. On top of that, if you worked 49 or more hours, you clocked out but still worked, or you were fired. Some weeks I had to work 80 hours or more. My record was 2 months with no day off. Vacation was a week, after you worked a year, no sick days. Plus vacation only paid for 5 days, unless you got sick, then that was deducted from your vacation. So many illegal things, and I worked there for 3 years, because the recession was so bad any I had to put food on the table. 
if you dared bring up the illegality of it all, you were fired for attempting unionization, even if that was never your intent. I'm a graduate assistant at a private university. Recently, administration has imposed new demands to my job. The new responsibilities are minimal, but that's beside the point. The fact that they have aggressively levied these new responsibilities onto myself and my peers for the sole purpose to save money for the institution begins to muddy the waters and undermine my position entirely. Bear with me, because this can get a tad obfuscated. The difficult aspect about the role as a graduate assistant is the lack of pay. Oftentimes compensation is confined to tuition waivers and minimal stipends. I get my education paid for, in return I work as an assistant to my supervisor, and in my case my supervisor is the university's soccer coach. In reality I only receive monthly direct deposit totaling no more than $600, before they garnish $200 for on-campus housing. So my net income is far below minimum wage. The reasoning upheld in court is that the we are students and not employees. So, my supervisor, the head coach, is the one that I work with on a day-to-day basis. He's the one that hired me, and he will be the one to release my contract if the time comes. How can the administrators tack on new job responsibilities when they aren't the ones overseeing my work? Would they really be able to fire me if I were to refuse to perform the new duties? After all, I'm still a student. Can the school fire their own students? The crucial benefit to my position is the intimate relationship I have with my coach. I work around the clock as he does in order to absorb all that I can. After I graduate, the most consequential effect won't be my free master's degree, but my coach's professional recommendation. In the instance that I refuse to jump through the hoops for administration, rather than terminating my position they could pressure my coach to reprimand me or fire me. Thus, undermining the legal reasoning as to why it's not illegal to be paying me way below minimum wage. Am I a student earning my free education by shadowing the coach? Or am I an employee that administration can manipulate? The whole concept is fake, and if anyone can better explain the exploitation of graduate assistants, I'd love to hear what others would have to say. I work for a contractor that works with Homeland Security on a military base. Our previous contractor company went under, spent all the contract money on something other than performing the job, and a new one stepped in, taking all of the existing employees as to avoid waiting on new potential candidates getting their clearance. The new contractor has mandatory health insurance, at $2 a HR deduction from our wages. It's not real health insurance though, just supplemental. To the best of my knowledge nobody has been able to use it to receive anything more than a few dollars discounted from medical services. They send out pretty regular emails and post signs at work saying that our medical coverage will likely not be recognized by healthcare providers. The steps given to address this particular issue are present coverage card and state this is supplemental coverage. When denied, ask the receptionist to call the number on the card so a representative can explain the nature of the coverage benefits to them. If further denied, just pay out of pocket and file a claim by sending a receipt with an explanation. If they send you a few dollars back it means you're covered for that service. If not, then you'll never get anything. I find it unlikely that it's legal to take $200-$300 slash month from a couple hundred individuals in return for basically unusable health insurance. The new company also takes a separate $2 slash HR for mandatory 401k, which not something I'm familiar with and seems odd to not allow an opt-out, however I actually keep that money in the end, so it's not nearly the same. A concrete company I used to work for was terrible. They had a laundry list of OSHA infractions at any given second, but besides that they would deduct equal time from your check that you are late. Example, if you were 30 minutes late, you wouldn't get paid for the 30 minutes you weren't there, and you wouldn't get paid for the next 30 minutes you are there. Force people to work like duty for heavily reduced pay if they got injured, and telling them the employee isn't covered under workman's comp. Quote federal and state jobs at prevailing wage and only pay 12, 15 tops. No lunch or breaks for 10, 14 hour shifts 5 point the worst thing about this place is they were supposed to be a union shop. They would routinely lay off everyone that wasn't a lead man or foreman every time there was a vote for the new union contract. 
not necessarily illegal but completely bullshit. 90 working days before you hit union ends up being closer to 7 months once you count rainy days. Constant layoffs if you started after January 10th, you had to wait until the next January 1st to start your one year wait to qualify for insurance and vacation. Purposely only plan enough work to cover 7 months a year so they can lay off everyone and delay providing any perks or raises. Kai resident here, my company, which is fairly international, so their policies are sure to break a law in one place or another. It is the company's policy that employees are not allowed weapons on the premises, including in their vehicles. With Iika we have the right to search your vehicle clause somewhere. I have a gun in my vehicle every day, at work or not, and I've been waiting for them to catch an itch to search my car. For the stid, Kai is a fantastic state for gun owners. Featuring statutes that allow you to keep a firearm, loaded or unloaded, in a glove compartment or similar factory compartment without needing a permit, it doesn't even have to lock. I have a Kai CCDW, so I can keep one anywhere in the vehicle, and my state is nice enough to exempt lower governing bodies from further regulating their statutes, including employers' rights to keep a firearm in the vehicle. The state specifically says they can't stop me, and they are liable for civil damages if they prohibit me from doing so, or suspend, fire, demote, or otherwise punish me for doing so. I'm lazy and, so I don't feel like linking, but the specific statute is KRS 236.107 for anyone who wants to google. Not sure if illegal or not, but shady, but ultimately better for the customer emo. I worked at a electronics store that sold phones. Customers could trade in their old phones for credit towards their new phones. Our system would calculate approximate 50-80% street value for the trade in value. So we would tell customers that were interested in a new phone that we would buy their phones back from them, run the trade in estimator, then just pay them cash for their phone out of our own pocket. Wipe it in front of the customer and fill out the trade in paperwork. Trash the paperwork and sell the phone on Craigslist for 20-30% profit. The phone never entered our inventory and the receipt just shows that the customer paid trade in value in cash towards their new phone. The reason this was better for the customer was because I could be like, I'll give you $80 for your phone, and if they were hesitant, I could butter. Maybe $90 makes the sale, maybe $100. So about 20% of people who traded in their phone actually got more money for it than they would have otherwise. I could make an extra $100 $200 a week doing this. And at minimum wage, this was super helpful in making rent. And I just want to reiterate that we wiped the phones directly in front of the customer. They were actually the ones that pushed the data reset button. So personal info being leaked would only be an issue if I sold the phone to someone with super forensic ability. I worked in a hotel where a housekeeper discovered bed bugs while freshening up the room. Our room's director came in and told us during our pre-shift meeting that they had moved that guest's luggage and effects to the room across the hall and then told us to lie to him and say we reassigned him because of a waterline break that was pouring through his ceiling and we didn't want his stuff ruined. So yeah, my boss boss explicitly told an entire shift team to be prepared for this guy to come back and call down. At which point we were supposed to lie to him about bed bugs, which are a big faking deal in hotels. They camped his whole stay, and we never heard anything else about it, but I told my manager I wasn't going to deal with that, and that I wouldn't lie to the guest. I really needed that job, so I didn't want to be fired for insubordination, so he let me go home, until the situation was resolved, and was cool about it. Everyone was kinda heated and feeling shady. I wish I had talked though. Even if I'd been fired, I think everyone would have stuck up for me in an internal investigation by corporate but everyone individually was so afraid of that director cause she was a huge beach with a witch and the wardrobe ice queen vibe about her. In a cafe no breaks ever. The manager would come in an hour late and take half an hour lunch for a 9, 8 hour day, plus at least one smoke break an hour, usually 10 minutes. The chef would be in an hour longer than he got paid to do, if he wasn't the kitchen would go to sheet and we'd close. He also got loads of smoke breaks. The other server got smoke breaks, usually to an hour on her 5 hour shift. 
if I was working open too close, 7 to 4.30 ish, I wouldn't get paid past 4, and no breaks so no lunch. I also got told off in front of customers that I knew personally for going to the toilet about 30 secs before the other three went on their smoke break because I left the front unattended. Have terrible eczema, asked repeatedly for gloves to wash up with. Finally got some, they were latex. Turns out I have a latex allergy. Tough. What happens if you work in a 35 deg point C cafe for 5 hours and no break to go outside? Terrible heat rash and heat exhaustion. Would almost pass out from standing up and drank about 8 L of water in 5 hours on average and didn't pee it out. You make a fuss. You get fired 70% turnover each year. I quit. Many years ago I worked for an animal hospital that was so faking shady. The building was old as balls and needed so much work that the owners slash veterinarians didn't want to pay for. These old men were so cheap they'd recycle used syringes. I sheet you not, they'd have us clean them with chlorhexidine, wrap them in sterile packaging, and run them through the autoclave. One of the veterinarians would switch out needles on syringes and keep them in an open box in a cabinet. I remember once an employee got bitten really bad by a boarding husky, and one of the veterinarians actually stitched her up and gave her some augmentin. Her wound got infected, and she lied to the human doctor about what had happened, because the vets were worried they'd lose their workman's comp insurance and get shut down. This one probably isn't illegal, but it still makes me cringe when I think about it. During every major holiday, that place would be packed. We were told we couldn't turn away any animals, even if we ran out of room. We had to make room somehow. There were cages set up in the hallways as the staff tried to cram more animals into the building. Cats were moved into tiny cages, where they could barely move. I said something about we are completely out of room back there in front of one of the receptionists, a really pretentious beach woman who bred AKC registered corgis. She took me aside and told me you can't say that in front of clients. You have to take the dogs and make room. And we got into it right there in the kennel. The hospital was sold many years ago, and the doctors retired. One of the new doctors is the woman who was bitten by the husky, and she is not suited for the business at all. I worked for two other hospitals before I left the field altogether. My old job had us driving locally. We took our work vehicle home and didn't have an office to clock in that we just went to work via a paging system. We were expected to leave 45 minutes before our shift to account for a commute. My boss at the time reasoned that he lived 45 minutes away from his office that he had to drive to every day and we were no different. Never mind that our office was on wheels and we were at the office when we left our house. So if I worked at 8 colon 00 a I had to leave at 7 colon 15 a. When it came to working time, we had to work up until our scheduled time. So again, working at 8 colon 00 a, with an hour of unpaid break mixed in there, we had to work until 5 colon 00 p, then commute home from there. Didn't matter where we were, whether it was an hour away from home or two. We were told that the first 45 minute of our drive home was commute time too. So that's 90 minutes each day that we are not being paid, but are out of the house. It's one thing when you're commuting to an actual office and are in one place all day. We weren't. We were in a work vehicle for anywhere from 5 to 7 hours a day. I noped out to there right quick and heard that that boss got a ton of complaints 2 hours and ended up getting fired. I've never verified the illegality of some of the policies at my old job, but I'm 98% sure some of them were illegal. I worked at a small lit section of a large firm for a few years. It was a dream job aside from the few whacked policies put in place by upper management that literally had no idea how it worked. For instance, work laptops were on rented time if they were taken home, which was at least once a week. Meaning, they literally docked pay for working at home. There was also non-mandatory fundraisers that were totally mandatory to avoid shaming and other repercussions. I never once received a donation receipt either. Before utilizing sick days, we had to submit to welfare checks at work, conducted by a contracted company physician. Most employees would just wait until business inspection day, but they put an end to that when the doctor started telling everyone how stupid looking and fat their dicks were. 
Just a real toxic atmosphere. This is no longer a policy because of me. My old job would have us report to our office before being getting in our trucks, loading any material we needed, and driving to at least one location. Say that location is two hours on the nose, and we don't need to load anything, so we can leave right away. We work at the site for eight hours before driving home. Total of 12 hours, right? Say you did that Monday to Friday. That's 60 hours. Overtime at 44, so 16 hours of overtime. What the company did was that the drive home from wherever we were, 5 minutes or 2 hours, didn't contribute to overtime. It was flat time. So you could work 60 hours a week and only get 6 hours of overtime and 10 hours of travel time. Very illegal. They did this for decades as far as I can tell. I did it for almost 2 years without complaint because even with working 60 hours sometimes, 50 overtime eligible hours usually, the money was good. I hit my limit about a year and a half in and started looking into my province's labor laws and found that it was very illegal. So I made a Ministry of Labor complaint alleging this with attachments of my pay stubs and my logbooks. I was assigned a ministry worker a few months later that followed up with me, confirmed that I wanted to officially file the complaint she sent a letter to the office I work at with the attached pay stubs and they promptly called me in two hours to have a meeting about it. They tried to say that it would be too expensive, that there isn't anything illegal, that they pay us well enough, that it doesn't matter, all kinds of sheet. Then they offered me a raise to drop the claim, which was a substantial raise. I dishonored myself, and I took the raise. I regretted it enough that I didn't stop. I dropped the claim, but a week later I threatened to do it again, if they didn't fix it within a year. It was November. They fixed it, and suddenly guys that regularly worked 2 hours away every day every week for 60 hours, weren't doing it anymore. I stopped working for those sleazer bags 2 months ago. I will now be making another claim regarding water, and health and safety. Drinking water is not supplied, we had to buy our own. It's hot work, like, in the summer sometimes 65 celsius. And in the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act, I believe, it's been a bit since I looked up the specific statutes. It says in one section that in every industry basically, drinking water must be supplied. It also says in the next section that if the work is hot, humid, or dusty, and the company has 10 or more employees, a shower must be provided, with at least one shower for every 5 employees. The work was hard, and grueling, and really faking hard on the body. The pay was sheet, especially considering other trades around us made almost double, sometimes more. I feel no remorse over taking those cunts over the coals once more. When my employer found out that I had a private pilot license and owned an aircraft, he made me fly parts out to other engineers. I don't have a commercial ticket. I wasn't even instrument rated at the time. But if a part needed to get out now, I'd get a call and have to jump in my plane and be two states away in a couple of hours. I went VFR into IMC twice on that job, I was nearly finished getting my instrument rating at the time, but I know that's no excuse. He did pay a pretty hefty bonus for every one of those flights. I figure it netted me about 200% of my operating costs, plus he gave me a 2x my hourly wage which was nice. He paid for my instrument rating as well. The bizarre thing about it is that he could have spent way less by going to the air cargo terminal of the local municipal airport and letting the professionals do the flying. Hell, most of the time the parts would arrive no more than a couple of hours later than if I flew them out. But he loved being able to tell his clients I'll have my pilot fly that part out to you right away. And to be fair, they ate that sheet up. Oh, the one funny thing was that he surprised me one day with a couple of big magnetic stick-ons with the company name and logo on them. He said he wanted me to put them on the sides of my airplane's fuselage. I told him I hope you didn't pay too much for them, because a, uh, the fuselage is made of aluminum, and b, it's illegal to modify an aircraft without an STC, supplemental type certificate. It probably wouldn't have killed me if I did something stupid like glue them on, but I'm not an aircraft designer, so I don't know that for sure. My former employer started a policy that, if you forget to clock out, management would estimate your time. 
and it was always way lower than the time you actually worked. Edit. Oh I forgot. Same employer and same management also pulled the following sheet on me. I was an employee there for years and years, and was in very good standing. When the new employee handbook came out it had a page in the back you were supposed to sign and hand in. It was one of those I have read and understand the employee handbook and agree to abide by the rules there in forms. Anyway management put out a memo saying that all employees had to sign it and turn it in and if they did not their paychecks would be withheld. Now in my job there I rarely saw management slash my boss at all. Maybe four times a year. I decided to forget about handing in the form simply because I did not want to and they started withholding my paychecks. I thought okay, this should be interesting, so I decided to just wait. No one confronted me about it. My paychecks just stopped being left out for me to pick up. And I figured that they thought I was just some paycheck to paychecks club like most of their employees and that I would come to them about my pay. I didn't. I just decided to wait. At the end of about 3 months of waiting I had to withdraw some money from my savings to pay bills, but I still had a few years salary in there. 2 weeks after that they finally left my paychecks for me to pick up. No one said anything. No one said anything to me, and I hadn't said anything to them. Everything went back to normal after that. Note, I decided if they had confronted me about it, that I would sign the paper and hand it in, and then a year later I'd remove it from my employee file. Just out of spite. Yes. I had access to my employee file, but they didn't know it. I had removed things from it before. Years later when retelling my story on Reddit I was informed what they had done was illegal. No cell phones on the floor, when the cash wrap phones can't dial 911 and even the direct numbers for hospital, fire departments and police didn't work. Even the office phones couldn't call out, or the closed room security phone. The hostile attacker slash gunman rules were to run and hide, after taking care of the customers, get to the safety round point, or defend yourself without causing damage to company property. The building was separate from the rest of the mall, with the RP being across the road in a 10 feet tall cinder block wild loading bay behind a pet store. No security cameras, no dumpster to shield, and that door was irrelevant according to the pet store employees, as they loaded from the front and staff preferred to use a door seen by cameras. I often had customers with guns, and a few large knives, on their person, men's department, and would discreetly tell security who was carrying, along with what and where on their person. Never had anything happen, but the guy did go next door to the pet store, and threaten employees there. Apparently the groomers messed up his dog's haircut, traumatized the dog while grinding its nails, and wanted him to pay for two baths, because they dog peed everywhere, so they bathed him a second time. First job I ever had, I worked for a company who refused to pay minimum wage. Their excuse was that, because they were an arcade slash amusement park for little kids, they could be billed as a seasonal business, and therefore duck the minimum wage requirements. They opened in a mall, and were open year around and indoor, so this was out and out bullshit. I worked there as a ride operator and ticket exchange person, only 16 and 17, for almost a year until they hired. My sister. After promoting my sister and I quit, my sister was finally fed up with the situation, still making 6.25 slash hours in 2009 slash 2010. She filed a complaint with the Department of Labor and they launched a gigantic investigation into the place. The mall was crawling with state and fed execs for a week. Apparently the company responsible for this had done the same thing in another mall location a few cities over and had carried this policy in company, records and everything else for several years before being reported. The company was fined somewhere between 25 and 45k in legal costs and was required to dig up records for 5 plus years of employment and pay absolutely every single one of their past employees back pay for the pay they should have received working under current minimum wage laws. For a small company this included at the very least 50 or more people because their turnaround was horrid. I don't think the company had ever really recovered from the loss. My sister remained working there for 4 more years after that and somehow endured that place. They never did pay her any more than minimum wage, and she was even a manager at one point. They treated their employees terribly, which is why I left of course, and they went bankrupt soon after my sister quit. 
As for myself, I received roughly 8 or 900 as a check in the mail and bought myself a PS3. Sorry for the awkward formatting as I'm on mobile. Edit. Sorry not sorry. Laugh out loud. I don't know or understand the complexities of internships paid slash unpaid, ECT. But I work as an intern in a lot theater. I'm here for a year. I work as a technician and generally work 40 hours a week and get $150 a week, taxed, and housing. Housing is pretty standard for theater techs. However, my hours are not specified and I make $150 whether I work 40 hours or 100 hours a week. I'm looking at working from this past Monday through the end of the new year with a total of two days off for that entire period and only because they are holidays, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. I will be working well over 100 hours a week with no increase in pay, no time off, cannot see my doctors, therapists, ECT because I'm expected to work 14, 16 hour shifts, 7 days a week, working both running shows and in the shop building the next show at the same time. I'm easily replacing the labor of two full-time workers, and I'm consistently treated like the whipping boy, which makes the experience wholly unenjoyable. I cannot leave, because to do so would make it, so I could never work in a theater again. It's a very tightly knit networking base community, but whether what I'm working is legal or not eludes me. Whether or not I can handle going months without being able to see my therapist, my endocrinologist, being able to get my prescriptions refilled, because my pharmacy is a two and a half hour drive away which I do not have time to get to is another thing. A few years back I was hired by a regional manager to do various in-office admin tasks for an authorized dealer of a telecom company in BC, Canada. This individual didn't work in the office. So I was trained in shifts of a few hours a day by a few ladies who had worked with the company for years, one was child of owner, that type of business. I was also tasked with taking several online courses specific to telecom company at home, which also involved a huge game of fac around as their interactive courses and tests only worked with certain browsers and even worse only certain much older versions of these browsers, and no module was the same, but I managed it. I made a point of asking regional manager how to report my hours for this, and he told me to email them to the ladies in the office. Okay, no problem. After a week of this few hours in office training, and then hours of a game of fac around at home very day, I told the office ladies that I will be emailing in my hours for the online training courses. They look at each other, then back to me with incredulity. Oh no no those are done on your own time, we don't pay for that, says senior office lady. I never got paid for that, confirmed junior office lady. Oh, sorry to hear that, it's the law and you should have I said as gently as I could. Guess who got called into the owner's office to get fired the next day. Oh and you better believe I made sure I was paid for my many hours wasted in training. I worked at a very well known corporate cell phone store and the sketchy things management would expect was absolutely despicable. Mind you, if upper management found out, they'd probably be fired. If you wanted a new phone, but weren't planning on getting accessories, then suddenly we wouldn't have it in stock. Don't know yet? It's alright. We'll just say the phone is in a timed safe which gives us plenty of time to make our sales pitch. There'd be employees who would sign the $14 a month insurance contracts without you looking, because they'd get disciplined for low insurance quotas. If we see that your account is eligible for a $15 a month price reduction, we would convince you that you received a free pair of beats or whatever you wanted by our company and we'd just charge that monthly payment after applying the monthly credit to get accessory commission. Got a problem with your bill? Our systems are down, but I'm positive everywhere does that so it's whatever. Did you pre-order a phone to our store? Well most likely you're not gonna buy accessories so, if our numbers are low, we'll just cancel your order and say that it's totally out of our hands. LPT, avoid cell phone stores at all costs. Do your sheet online to avoid dumbers fees and extra crap added to your bill. Company policy for Cox Communications is to be dumb as hell, especially if the employee ID starts with XRX or Zare. Anyway, get a Xerox account, guy transferred services to his new address, and was still receiving bills for the old address. 
For those of you who want a little bit more in-depth detail of what happened, someone created a work order to transfer services, services were activated on new account, new account work order was closed, but the old account that the transfer was being performed on never had its work order closed, extremely simple sheet, individual had like 3, 4 services, and needed a $1500 credit or some sheet like that. For basically being double billed, so I noted the entire thing, but, I was cable tech, policy states we are not to handle billing calls. Before I go on, the problem is this individual repeatedly called about this issue, but no one noted the account, just verified and accessed tons of screens and icons, I checked through and basically he must have gotten the most lazy people, but I will tell you what really happened see. Try to transfer over to billing, while the I put the customer on hold, billing guy opens account, sees the note I had already saved, sees that I noted all the inactivity and the fact that the original account's work order should have been shut off at specified date, and required 3 month credit basically, I did the math out, and that included all the past due interest charges that built up on the account, that should have been closed, billing guy hangs up on me, doesn't note the account and this is repeated three times, I tell the customer honestly what is happening, because, fat cocks, I'm here to work for the people, not summer's hat multi-billion dollar cable company buying 2.99 refurbished cable boxes from China, and renting them out at 9.99 a month to their customers. He realizes, I'm good cheat and he at least got over to someone who does their faking job, pretty much tells me he's scared to be transferred, even though I have noted the account. I try one more time, and get a billing supervisor who tells me unofficially in a subtle way, that Cox did not want to credit him, they wanted it to go to third party and fack this guy over, it was extra money, and they could sell a $1500 debt for $600, that shouldn't have been charged in the first place, that the person will likely either pay off, if they got good credit and are functional, or not pay it off, and let it get worse. He proceeds to hang up on me, and tell me to handle it in whatever fashion will get him off the phone without providing the credit basically, not his exact words, but definitely the gist. I'm cable tech, but, I know how to work the systems and I know a few authorization codes, so I go over my credit limit, credit the guy, note everything, all the hang ups, that billing did not want to provide credit, etc. Operations manager pulls me off floor in 2 minutes after the call, beaches, tries to give me a write up, I refused said write up, they instead took a few months to harass me, then fashioned a story, that I was violent to terminate me, and then I got $2400 from them in severance afterward. Instead of being faked over, I helped this individual, and then I got faked over, but it was totally worth it. Working off the clock to help my manager or my coworkers I liked. I'm not an asshole about it, especially when I know I'm leaving someone with more work than what is physically possible. I will help when I possibly can. The problem comes when I get into trouble for doing what I've done and people expect it. I'll be the first one to come in and the last one to stay. It's those managers who try to take advantage of me and get me to work off the clock because they messed up. My answer is always, nope. 9 out of 10 understand, but it's that small percentage that get emotional about it. Give an inch, and people take a mile I guess. I don't like many corporations because of it. In fact I tell everyone I work for them, and not the actual company. That has usually done me well in interviews. People on Reddit love to say people like me can sue. Yet let me see you lose your minimum wage job, and hire a lawyer against a multinational corporation. It's not like I'm illegally allowed to record anything on premises. So therefore every type of proof available is actually up to the employer to submit. Again I work for people. That's why many of the people I worked for are my best friends now. It usually works both way. Even 10 years later I can put them down and get an amazing reference. Answer, not a policy per se, but I bet this is a trend of my former employer. Threatening to fire employees, then telling them they need to retrain, unpaid, and firing them, if they ask for payment. Story time, I was a new waiter at this restaurant in St. Paul, let's call it Shamrocks. It's super successful owned by two guys, one super cool let's call him not Ted, and one massive insufferable dickhead let's call him Ted Casper. 
Anyways, three weeks and we are slammed during the lunch rush, and two of the three computers are down. I have to cover line over 20 something tables, since one person didn't show up. If you're unfamiliar with being a server, this is a near impossible task for tenured servers, nonetheless straight impossible for a new server. Lieutenant dickhead owner was working that day and wanted to fire me for doing a sub per job. I told him how much I needed the work. So he decides to retrain me for 2 weeks, completely unpaid. It amounted to 49 hours, minimum wage mind you, all for free. I realized my mistake when I was told by a manager specifically not to clock in. At the time, I thought it may be a test or whatever, so I do it, but keep track of my hours diligently. It was something like 8 shifts, one had to be middle shift through closing which racked up the hours. Anyways, I realize I will actually not be paid and told the manager I know this is illegal and I will have to file a claim if I'm not covered. I truly did not want to play hardball, just paid for my wages owed, nothing more, nothing less. Being the nice guy that he is, he tries to move money around and not have it show on the books, since he knows his job is likely in jeopardy, if he does so. A few days later I go to get my check, it shows my due wages, but I was let go for literally not addressing wage disputes with an owner. TLDR. Ted Casper, owner of Shamrock's Irish Nook is a wage-stealing, job-threatening dirtbag. Every one of his staff, including co-owner, not Ted is fantastic. I hope you do support that business, but I think he should be publicly shamed for his bullshit. Bit late to the party but anyway, I worked for a popular chocolate brand associated with Purple in the UK in their outlet stores. I technically didn't work for the company, but a franchise trading as the chocolate company. Firstly their food hygiene was terrible bird poos on boxes of chocolates which we were then told to wipe up and put out to the public. Open pick and mix was put back out to be sold to customers who wouldn't realize till they left for full price. And every bag and label in the store was kept right next to the employee toilet. The manager who was a control freak fired the entire role team when she came in without any warnings or cause. One girl couldn't do the changed rotor because of college and after telling the manager she was told not to come back even to work her notice. If we weren't all young with better prospects anyone fired would have had grounds to take them to a tribunal. We closed for a shop fit and according to our contract we aren't entitled to pay if it was outside the company's control but they opted for it so we should have been paid for it. The manager used our holiday pay to pay us for the closed time and I suspect but can't prove she did it through the year so it didn't look like she was using as many hours. They also refused to give under 18's proper breaks because they get additional breaks because of their age. I realized this and told the manager as did the two supervisors she still refused to give them, so I ended up telling the under 18s directly, after which she did give them breaks. I was then called into the office and warned not to do that again, and I should have told her. Despite being the second longest member of staff and the only one who could use the computer she let me go one week early only one month after promoting me after the old supervisor was fired for sitting down on a shift. A couple things, I'm a medical provider and work at a busy urgent care. There is usually one provider that works the 12 hour shift, and I work an 8 hour shift, to help with how busy it is. I often work beyond 8 hours due to surgery slash procedures I do myself, and tests that I have to wait for, and then treat. But I'm not allowed payment beyond those 8 hours due to me supposedly having another provider there, so it is my duty to take the easier patients the last 15 minutes before I leave which is usually not possible. But when I do inform the staff that I should leave at a certain time, I'm guilted into staying longer, even when I have the ability to leave on time. I've even been harassed at least once about this. I'm a new graduate, so I'm slower than the other providers. When I asked for help to make my charting more efficient, since I often take my work home and get further training on the electronic medical health slash chart system, my boss told me not to worry about it. He will train me on a day he is available, although he's a really busy guy and trained me for 5 hours unpaid. He made it clear it would be unpaid. Though, the other new hires got an onboarding training session I was unable to attend previously. I asked if we can go over those things as well, and he agreed. 
I said it should be paid, since they were paid for that. He said they weren't, and guilted me for wanting to be paid to drive 45 minutes each way, to work and stay for 4, 5 hours unpaid. Honestly, I don't believe they were unpaid. We are unable to talk about how much we get paid, it is against company policy. This was years ago, and no longer there, but, pretend your salary was $28,080 a year. This comes out to $13.50 an hour. 28,080 slash 2080 hours. Rather than pay the $13.50, your pay was actually $12 an hour, but they paid you for 45 hours a week. Why? It was rare you'd actually ever get to sit and take a full hour for lunch. So it wasn't uncommon to put down that you worked 8.5 or 8.75 hours a day. At the end of the week, you may have 3, 5 hours of overtime. Apparently this was killing the op budget in this department, so they dropped the pay and gave you the 45 hours a week. This flew all over me, especially if someone in another department was making the same salary, they had a higher rate of pay. Essentially you had to work an extra 260 hours a year to make the same salary as someone in another department. Plus you had to work more than 45 hours to actually get any yacht, and when you did, you were getting the yacht rate on the $12 an hour, not the $13.50 incredible. My old job was a small business, let's say it was a crossfit gym, even if it's not, so we got out of a lot of local labor laws. Technically, we didn't have to take breaks. Myself and the other manager often took working dinners, because we would only have one other staff member on. While this isn't illegal, in our state, what was was when the owner would openly state that she would not pay us for something that was a required part of our job. Think something like this, certain staff would create workouts and then have each other try our workouts to make sure they flowed. The creation we got paid for, trying each workout was not paid for, even though we had to do it. What was worse was one of the other managers got voluntold to help create workouts one week as well as work the whole day. This was at least a 12 hour shift in total, of which she was only paid half, because she wasn't officially a workout creator. I had one of my staff come tell me that the owner told her that, because she was at risk of going over 40 hours that week, I was to cut her early. The owner had no overtime policy, because she kept everyone part time. I told her I would try, but that it wasn't my fault the owner didn't have a policy in place. This same worker took on manager duties, worked almost 40 hours a week, and had numerous responsibilities much more significant than an average person, but was paid the base rate $10. There were some other things that weren't illegal but definitely shady, like telling me I had to go to help with another gym's competition, but was not intending to pay me until I basically forced her to the owner would give me a raise, but it was always on the second paycheck after the announcement, which usually happened to be the smaller of the two. Don't get me started on how we constantly interacted with the public, from very young to very old, and the owner would always have her daughter at work, but her child was not vaccinated. The staff were also treated harshly if they called out sick, so calling out sick was usually avoided if possible. Worked for a massive fast food chain specializing in fried chicken, I have a few. In from the UK, where holiday pay is a legal entitlement. When I submitted an application for my holiday the manager hid it behind the PC in his office. I found it three weeks later and gave it to the next highest ranked person. Never got any holidays as I resigned before they came about, but didn't get holiday pay when I left either. The closing up was supposed to take no more than an hour, but they had one person do the entire serving and eating areas each night. I found myself clocked out by the manager several times, well before my shift ended. The food, namely chicken, that went to waste, was tracked by the computer and count D at the close by the manager or team leader on duty. This was pretty obviously, to stop employees eating it. The chicken then gets frozen and thrown into the bins along with all the other waste. One time I asked what we should say if a customer asked what happened to the extra chicken and was told it went to charity. Not sure on this one, but it might be tax fraud. At the very least they were supposed to be disposing of food waste and general waste differently. Also the fryer grease was always just poured down the drain at the end of the day. Apparently kitchens are supposed to take care of it another way. 
Lastly they would label some products with time cooked and use by times. When these expired they had us peel off the labels and attach new ones saying they were just freshly made. I managed to avoid that job every time. That seemed like the one I could get in trouble for. A bunch of people, including myself, for a specific project were hired and one perk, being tenure-based raises for all employees regardless of projects and sole project, paid different hourly wages. These were to be added over the course of an employee's continuous employment for a total of an extra $1.50 per hour after two years. We were told this in the hiring process, during our training, and when we came out of training. I got a promotion 6 weeks in, so I went to $13 an hour 6 months passes and I checked my ADP for 3 paychecks, no wage increase. Talked to a few colleagues about it, and I found out that 1, no one on the project, had gotten it and 2, people from various training classes were told different time frames for wage increases. I work in a small department, and make more than others working on the project, but I was still pissed. So I went to two department heads about it and nothing was done. Then I went to the project manager, nothing was done. I finally escalated to the head of ours and he did nothing, since it wasn't explicitly stated in my pre-employment agreements and post-employment paperwork. He also reprimanded me and told me it was against the code of conduct to discuss salary and hourly wages with those who were below me, and if I did it again I would be written up. Not really are illegal, but my medical school I attend frequently and regularly violates the accreditation guidelines of more or less our student rights. Meaning they fuck up the bare minimum of sheet they need to do to be able to award medical degrees, especially in terms of how they treat the students. They also frequently accept students with subpar grades and standardized test performance knowing they will probably fail out for the extra dollar sign dollar sign dollar sign. The year above us lost some 50 people out of a class of 230, which is below the maximum attrition rates to keep accreditation. They hide this by more or less berating slash strong arming them into forcing at risk students to repeat a year, minorities, and women only though, withdraw from the program, or taking an indefinite leave of absence. By doing this, they game the system and hide their 22% attrition rate. They also hit this by making us take a non-graded mock board exam where those who underperform are forced to retake it and study during a break, and if they don't improve they have to meet with the dean, and he basically tells them they have no future, will fail boards, and need to drop out, or they will fail out in second year or fail boards, and get kicked out, and we can't report it, because if we do they can and will find out and retaliate. Even if someone did report it, they would only be hurting themselves if the accreditation got pulled, because then they wouldn't be able to earn their degree. From speaking to faculty who know me this apparently started when the new head of the board of trustees took over. Within a year the class size was doubled, tuition went up, resources available to medical students started being cut due to lack of interest and faculty who were considered good professors began to leave including four, five top-notch professors and the dean who had been there since the school opened. The school is very clear in showing us that they do not respect us or our time and that they only tolerate us for the tuition money. Even if they don't say it, it's obvious with their actions. Oh cool I actually have something for this. So I work for a smallish transport and logistics company is Australia, and one of our major contracts is with a massive international shipping lines, to be their local container depot and bond store. Now the shipping lines policy for containers, that hired to import goods is, that the customer has 7 days, to arrange to have to container collected from our bond store, emptied and returned, or they will get it with excess detention charges. Now, because my company is not just a depot slash bond store, but also a transport company we are often the ones who deliver the containers to the customers. When this is the case we will almost always report the container as dehired on time to the shipping line, regardless of the fact that a lot of the time it's still sitting loaded waiting to be delivered. Basically the customer doesn't get a massive detention bill, we don't get it passed on to us, and we get a good relationship with the customers, but I'm pretty sure it's technically defrauding the shipping line. TLDR, transport company slash container park fudging the books, to shave customers money at the expense of the shipping line. So here in my province we follow the 8 over 44 rule. 
My understanding of the rule was for anything worked over 8 hours a day you are paid over time for that day. If a Saturday was worked then for the first 4 hours of that day you are paid regular time despite working 8 hours a day mf hence 44. I'm pretty sure the last company I worked for wouldn't pay me overtime properly. As a full time employee I found myself working above 8 hours a day here or there and they would refuse to pay me the overtime because I didn't exceed the 44 hour mark per week also using paid lunch as a justification to not pay overtime. My counter to that was they legally had to pay us lunch because we were required to be on call during our lunch breaks. I don't know the actual rules, but I'm pretty sure they still couldn't withhold overtime pay whether or not they paid for lunch. I didn't work much overtime there to begin with, but there were plenty of days where I banked an extra hour or so and they would outright refuse to pay me. It got to the point where another staff member caught on and started passive aggressively posting the labor laws regarding overtime pay on the windows and walls of the building. They actually got upset at me for thinking that I was spreading a rumor of them falsely paying people. I didn't tell a soul besides asking one of the sales representatives and the head accountant for clarification I'm pretty sure that was illegal. Not sure if either was illegal, but I thought both were kind of dick things to do to your employees. We were forced to use our PTO for any missed work. So if you called in sick they used your PTO, and you couldn't request any time off without PTO. You got 10 hours of PTO a month so basically one sick day, and you lost the whole month's worth of PTO. They wouldn't let you schedule any time off without saved up PTO, and you weren't even allowed to request non-paid time off. If you wanted to get FMLA you had to have insurance through the company, so they could make sure you weren't faking it. Time off was a huge pain in the ass, and the only way I survived there was because my uncle worked in the staffing department, so he could help me not get screwed over when I got sick. Second they had people distracting specific regions, and they had us as bare bones as possible. The problem with that was there was such a high turnover rate, and so many people hated their jobs, that people wouldn't show up for work, or would call out sick at the last minute, which made everyone else hate those jobs more, because now we had to do the job of two, three people. There was one afternoon I got to work, and found out everyone on my team, had called out, so I and my manager had to work the jobs of four people each. Only reason I didn't say fuck it and walk out was because my manager was a really nice guy. Not really illegal, but concerning to say nonetheless, my current casual job doesn't follow a proper roster system. So if any employee were to be called in for work, they would either be called in within 24 hours before the shift or on the very last minute. This applies to everyone. This makes making plans ahead of time more of a gamble than scheduling. For example, if I were to make plans for next Tuesday to go out and film for an assignment, as in doing a film degree, I have to be aware that I may be texted on Monday or on Tuesday morning to come in and therefore having to either a. cancel last minute for plans to film or b. say no to work and risk my reputation. Why don't you tell your work you are unavailable ahead of time? The hours at my work doesn't care too much and will still attempt to contact you, even if you told them ahead of time you are unavailable. Tell your hours that you are doing an assignment or something more important than work oh I do, they just hang up with a noticeable angry groan. I'm qualified as hourly versus commission, whichever is greater. I reach my commission, but they take out a product fee, $8, on top of service, before calculating our commission on every service we do on a guest. I'm expected to work a set hours per week, just under part time, but if a guest comes in, say 30 minutes before we close, and stays past the time we are set to work, I'm expected to service the guest. Basically treated like an employee, but with the pay of independent contractor. I clock in and out, but none of that matters since I surpass the hourly minimum. And when tax season comes around I conveniently always owe money. Even though I have federal income and state tax removed from my paycheck every two weeks. The eyes came for them before they had this hourly vs commission pay structure and it was just commission. So stylists were sitting and when it was slow and only making $75 for two weeks but we were really employees. Expected to clean, work a specific schedule, attend classes that are unpaid as they believe we are paid in education. 
they were reported and sued before from a former employee. They ended up paying some of us money that was owed, but I'm still fairly sure since those changes, there is still some shady sheet at play. They used to require me to clean out my company truck unpaid at specific locations. So I'd have to drive 20 minutes to a specific dumpster to clean out all the trash from doing installs all day, an additional 20 minutes, and then drive home, or risk being written up. Added another hour to my day for no real reason, and it was never paid. They also wouldn't let me take lunch or breaks on 12 plus hour shifts sometimes, because they considered my paid drive time between installs to be my break. I was also required to pay inflated prices on items I needed for installs. I remember I had to buy my work phone from them for $250 when the actual cost with a plan was $0.99, or without a plan $150. When the phone got broken on the job they took it out of my paycheck without asking me for another $250. I was also put on unpaid suspension one time for hanging up on my supervisor, even though I was driving, can get a ticket for talking on phone and driving. I hung up because I almost got in an accident because he was screaming at me and distracting me. That 7 day suspension hurt. I also hurt my back on the job and my doctor put me on some work limitations. I think my doctor just wrote out to restrict my hours to under 40 or something. Was required to work over 60 at the time and my supervisors harassed me every day about it. I was constantly ratted out to other employees for slacking and making them do my work. It got really hostile to the point where I couldn't even talk to anyone because everyone thought I should just be fired. This was all one job. I worked at a car dealership and our boss instituted a policy where if we didn't get people's personal information, we'd have to go out and reorganize the entire lot. As in, clean out every car because our Mac already didn't do their jobs inside and out and repark everything perfectly. A few hundred cars. This meant you'd have to spend all day on rough asphalt, on your hands and knees trying to clean out the cars, or contorting yourself to get into the ones that were in there without the car doors dinging into each other, because you only had a foot or two of space between the cars. Most of our staff was 55 or older. One of them was still receiving cancer treatment. The policy applied to everyone. Additionally, if you didn't get a customer to willingly fork over information on them, we were told we had to copy their home address off the license we photocopied for the test drive and we would mail them tons of bullshit about our cars. Our dealership also regularly drove cars without license plates at all, but that's a shockingly common thing. They told us if we got pulled over to tell the copo it must have just fallen off and that they'd back us up back at the dealership and say they remembered us driving off with one on there. I'm also pretty certain our owner was committing insurance fraud a good amount. Whenever there was damage to a car our bosses were informed they had to find the highest quote possible for repairs. They'd send that off to the insurance company and then he'd have his friends repair the car on the cheap and he'd pocket the extra cash. He used to own the collision repair place as well, but as it stood it seemed he would give them kickbacks to play along. My company has really terrible attendance policies. The clock they use to mark employees on time all eight rounds up or down. So if you arrive at 8 hours, 0 minutes and 30 seconds you are late. If you arrive at 8 hours, 0 minutes and 29 seconds, then you are on time. To get around this, most employees lodge in at 7.59. Our timesheets only allow us to enter time in quarter measures. So if we lodge in 1 to 14 minutes of extra time, we cannot add it to our timesheet because it hasn't hit 15 minutes mark, which means we don't get paid for it. Our company has sick time, but it has to be approved before you can use it. If you are out of work for sudden illness, even hospitalization with a note, they give you an attendance point. If you accrue so many points, you get written up then terminated. A few years ago, a man contracted bacterial meningitis on a company trip. He was working one night and collapsed when it was discovered. He ended up being out for two weeks because of it. A hazmat team was called in to disinfect the area. They still fired this guy. My company lost all of their employee details. Because of I-9 laws, we were required to provide copies of her driver's licenses, SSN cards and passports to our direct supervisors, so he could make copies. A have no hour debt, because the company dissolved their positions, cheap. 
there was no safeguards in place for other employees to see information of other employees. There are more instances, but they piss me off too much when I write about them. When I was 18, I worked at a fast food place with an incredibly shitty owner who stole money from some employees and let others steal from the till, among other bullshit. When I got my first check, I noticed that money was taken out for my uniform, which consisted of the ugliest shirt imaginable, a visor, and a name tag. I found out years later that an employer can't charge an employee money for the uniform if the uniform is something that they wouldn't conceivably wear out in public. For example, if it has the company logo and or name on it, or if it's just garish and obviously a uniform. If it's something like a plain collared shirt or button down, the employee may have to pay out of pocket. All three of the uniform items I was charged for had logos and the company name all over them. Bonus story, he also implemented a rule that employees were no longer allowed to talk to each other unless it the subject was work related. The building was plastered with signs typed in all caps to inform us of the new rule, ending with something along the lines of you're on my time while you're here. Around this time, I had found a meme of Joseph Stalin that simply said, silly worker, that will get you sent to the gilag. My inner rebel wanted so badly to print out the meme and attach it to the cork board under the sign, but it was gone before I could, and I had rent to pay, and had a hell of a time just getting that cheat job. Apparently a bunch of employees and managers told him he couldn't do that, because duh, we do have some rights, like it or not. Bonus bonus story, the guy I ended up marrying was a manager there, and he just informed me that if there were leftover breakfast sandwiches, those would go into the walk-in and would be the first sandwiches served the next day. He also yelled at people who used more than one paper towel to dry their hands. I have so many more stories about this douchebag, if anyone is interested. At my last job I worked in the claims department for an auto parts dealer. We sold parts for Chryslers, Hondas, Toyotas, Kia slash Hyundai, etc. My job was to inspect damaged parts that we got back from body shops and determine if those parts could be claimed with their respective manufacturers so that we could get money slash credit back for those parts. Here's the thing, each company has a time frame for returning parts. GM allows 90 days for pretty much anything, dents, defects, etc. So those were pretty easy to write up. But companies like Ford had a 3 day window for damaged stuff, though it was 28 days for defective parts. Chrysler Fiat had a 7 day window. Audi was something stupid like 48 hours. And that was based on when we received the part in our warehouse. If the part was outside of that time frame, oh well. So if we bought a part and then sold it, say, 3 weeks after we received it in our warehouse and it was damaged, then there's nothing we could do, legally. How did we get around this? Swapping boxes. We'd order a new part, then put the damaged part in the new box and claim it arrived that way. If it was a bare metal piece, like an exhaust system, we'd have to swap factory stickers. This meant putting a heat gun to the stickers on the old and new parts and swapping those. GM has coded stickers on the inside of most of their parts that match stickers on their boxes, so we'd have to swap those around before swapping boxes. Chrysler does the same thing, but their stickers are tougher to remove. Ford really didn't give a sheet. Honda and Acura would deny claims, even if they were legit, if there was so much as a tear in the package, regardless of whether or not it caused damage to the part. It was shady as fuck, but apparently the auto industry is well aware of it. It's one of those things where they allow it as long as they don't see you doing it. We also found out that some of our bigger clients would purchase cheaper third party parts and put those on a customer's vehicle while charging the customer for the OEM part. Or they'd fuck up the installation of a part but deny they did it, meaning we couldn't return the part to the manufacturer. Glad I'm not doing that anymore. Pizza places are the worst. I worked at one that had termites in the wall near dry storage, black mold on the walls under the dish sink, and a basement that all sorts of illegal sheet happened in. Employees did drugs down there, bums broke the windows, and slept down there, at least twice that I know of employees have faked down there, one being a 20 something manager with a 16 year old, etc. The building used to be some sort of mail service, and had a vault down there with padded walls. 
Those walls are full of bullet holes, where the manager and a few employees used to go down, and use it as a private pistol range. We also wash dishes with concentrate mixed into one sink of water, and then we sanitize them in a sink of bleach water. Yeah, bleach. I got fired from there for getting stomach flu and not bringing back a doc's note after going home early one day and calling in the next two, even though my girlfriend worked there with me and backed up me puking and cheating my guts out for a few days. I was quite literally fired from a restaurant for not coming in while I was puking. That was a year ago. At this point I'm pretty much waiting for her to find a new job she likes before the health inspector and local newspaper get some anonymous tips. They're easily the most popular place around here too. They blow dominoes and pizza slutched out of the water. If only people knew how nasty she'd got back there. Oh man. I don't even know where to start. If someone gets hurt while working we are encouraged to push them to put it through their own insurance instead of workers comp. We take them to the ER or urgent care and they lie saying they got hurt at home doing whatever and that we are a friend who drove them. If someone doesn't want to do that, odds are they are on the top of the list when it's time to lay someone off. One of the office ladies hurt her leg and was out for a couple weeks. While she was out they had someone take over her job. When she came back, they bounced her around different departments with a significant cut in overtime and then when they ran out of places for her they fired her. Our employee handbook says that you cannot have anything outside of work that may interfere with your ability to do your job. It specifically says, if you have another job, that could cause you to have to leave at the end of your shift, but before you're done with whatever you're doing, that you can be fired. Not sure that this is illegal though. We went through a period where we couldn't have any overtime. So instead of getting paid for anything over 40 hours, we were directed to keep track, and it could be used later as secret time off. Which worked okay, until ours enforced a policy that all time off has to be approved in writing, then all that secret time off disappeared. Only ever worked at two call centers, both shady as fuck one building company that was two faced for lack of better wording. There was a BBC Watchdog episode about this place where they got a job and went in undercover with a cam to get footage. They caught a manager ripping pages out of Fauna books photocopying them and handing them out for people to ring. Funnily enough I ended up meeting him as he was now the manager at place number 2. They had you calling people between the ages 25 and whatever to see if they had worker around machinery or building sites to make hearing damage claims. The managers, or walkers as we would call them would walk up and down listening to everyone's scripts. They would frequently tell you to lie and put people through just in case they meet the criteria as they was paid X amount per person for referrals. This lead to obvious sales targets for these meetings, but also a cash in hand payment of £50 and an early finish if you got 10 in one day. This lead to corruption where some managers and people in office were giving the people who called the sales back to confirm them backhanders to change the name on people's sales so they hit 10 every day by 12pm. The managers were abusive, one guy threatened to go after a lady on the phone. If you ask to be removed there way no way of doing so, or any way to ask for you to be removed from the list as the delete button was actually an X button. They threatened people's jobs one Friday by saying you have to get 5 today or you're all fired, so a lot of people left and didn't go back. Sure they still operate. 2. Did PPE claims which is pretty standard for the time, but they had an office where there was one long set of booths with 20 something computers set up that were empty every week they would fill those seats with new hires, the rules where you follow policy when on the phone, wear full suits and dresses etc, but you work the first week and on the Friday you find out if you have the job. If you don't you don't get paid for the days worked. As you can guess they just don't take anyone on and have a team of 20 odd newcomers working free for a week, every week, all run by the same shady fact from story 1. 3. Working 60, 70 hour weeks, 4 hours from home so staying away, not in our contracts, but was fairly well looked after so cracked on for the cash. PPE was provided as you asked for it, but there was a general fuss around them buying it, you so we had some stuff but not others. I had been vaud pants. Tops, boots and everything but no waterproof panting. 
Anyway, one day I was moving concrete, we started at 7, and worked straight through till 7 as the hotel was boring, and we wanted to get as much done, and get our heads down. It was drizzling rain but nothing heavy, there was two of us, and we had a full size football pitch, to place 1x1 flags the whole length around, we spent the day, before putting the flags nearby where they was being placed, so my mate laid them, and I made up the concrete with a mixer, and pushed it about 200 meters across grass, and left it with him, and took the empty barrow. Through the day I started to get pains in my knees, thought it was nothing just tired, so I cracked on. Home time came round, so we headed back to the hotel, to get changed to go eat, and when I went for a shower I noticed I had massive 10 inch long burns down both my legs over both knees. I had my shower, went for food, and got some bandages from the hotel reception. Went to work the next day finishing the flags, hung up safety signs, and called the boss, to say I was going home. I went to the hospital. That night and the nurse was horrified, she never knew concrete could do that. Neither did I love. The bosses turned up at my house the next day, to check I was alright they said I was okay to have the next two weeks off paid no questions, but I need to tell the safety board I had waterproofs in the van, and opted not to use them. To a couch, ridden 20 year old me who'd spent the better part of the summer 6 months 4 hours from home, 2 weeks there sounded great so I agreed. It wasn't until I was late it or six months later I realized what I'd done. An old job of mine was terrible. I'd be forced into 16, 20 hour shifts with no breaks at all. The district manager would then go in and alter the time codes, so I would have taken two 30 minute unpaid breaks. They scheduled me for these shifts up to 17 days in a row without a single day off, nor more than the four hours in between shifts. I was not paid any of the overtime, they would eventually just use those hours at regular pay rates on a random paycheck here and there. I was promoted at one point, signed something about my wages, and whatever, they never gave me the raise, which was about $2 slash HR more. When I brought it up, it took them about a month and a half, and they refused to pay me any of the back pay regardless of the fact that I had a signed paper stating my new pay rate and date. Our minors were not allowed breaks either, even though some were as young as 15. They would also be scheduled to work until 2am on school nights. One time we had a fire breakout. Filled the entire place with smoke. Firefighters weren't 100% sure what it was, I waited on our maintenance man to get there. DM demanded we go back in and serve all the food that was covered in ash and ceiling tile crap from the firefighters trying to figure out what was going on. Had a leak on our ceiling above the hotline, beef, chicken, beans, that dropped directly into the food. Refused to fix it until our drive through speed was faster, and when we tried to at least tie a bag up to deter the water not into the food, they made us take it down. Hot water and sink didn't work for about two months. So dishes were not properly washed or sanitized, not to mention the big no-no of working without hot water. Yeah. Place was a mess and tbh I bet it's not any better since I left and took my crew with me. I refuse to eat there to this day. I used to work for a Huntington Learning Center, https, slash slash Huntington helps. First, the system requires a certain number of hours of tutoring be purchased before accepting students. The lowest amount I saw was 24 hours at $80 per hour. Deals ranged all the way up to 240 hours at $60 per hour. Most people can't afford that type of cash up front, so the system offers loans. The loans have a 14% interest rate. As far as I know, 8% is the maximum rate for my state. But it gets better. In the contract is a vaguely worded clause which states that customers seeking refunds must apply for the refund no more than 90 days from the first lesson. So my boss would simply ignore calls and emails from frustrated parents until the 90 day period was up, then deny them the refund because they didn't contact us sooner. Mind you, this same boss also failed to pay teachers on time and would fire people who demanded their money, so there were all sorts of problems. I quit the job when the state police entered the building with a warrant, looking for my boss, who was conveniently vacationing in one of her beach houses at the time. Three years later, the building is now a Chinese restaurant, so I guess that's a small victory. I work for a mailbox slash shipping store. 
Our boss is usually kind of a stickler for the rules. Not shipping liquor. Not shipping cash. Etc. He's an overzealous people pleaser. Around 60. Recently divorced and very religious. Half of our box holders are his church friends, Jehovah's Witnesses, and they shoot the sheet, and he lets them drop stuff off for us to pack, and charge their house accounts later. One guy brings in about 12 different grocery bags full of stuff to ship, each with their own address. I start packing up the first box, and it's just t-shirts and a whole lot of weed. Like truly a lot of weed. It's legal here, wah, but not federally, and shipping has some major do's and do nots. Shipping illegal substance is being pretty big do nots. I kind of pull my boss over and show him, and he just nods, and says I know, it's just for customer, just say they are samples for the description. So I shrugged, packed 12 boxes of t-shirts and weed, and shipped them all out. We all use the same code for our pose, and it was originally from a girl who worked with us like 10 years ago. If the shipping company were to open one of the boxes, our store could get it with the fine, but they'd never be able to pin it on any one of us. Mitch Hedberg once said the UPS driver is a drug dealer and he doesn't even know it. But we know. I was the director of a preschool that was privately owned. The owner of the preschool owned about 9 fast food restaurant, international chain, and multiple houses for rent. He was making a lot of money, he would hire illegal immigrants, so he didn't have to pay them as much and teenagers. He required the preschool to pay rent to him, even though he owned the building and the business, we couldn't afford to pay the amazing employee more than minimum. He was keeping the school in the 90s, and I would get scolded for buying new toys and learning things for the kids. The state would come in for inspection and tell us, you need to paint, you need new flooring, you need more outside toys. I finally told them our situation and they tried their best to help. He wouldn't let me hire the appropriate number of staff then would get mad at us for having overtime. All classrooms are required to keep a certain teacher to student ratio. He wanted me to have only one person open and one close and mix ages infant to 6. Sometimes there would be 10 to 12 kids that came in before the next person came in. The one person was expected to make breakfast and watch the kids. He finally decided to close, when I said screw you, I'm following the state's rules, because my name is on that license and not yours. He gave us a 4 day notice. It was awful. I hate him for it. My first job was at Mr. Car Wash 99% of the outside staff, i.e. all the people working cars, were Mexicans that barely spoke English, if any at all. I would say illegals, but I don't actually know that for a fact, so I won't accuse it. We had no actual shift schedule, you basically showed up whenever you wanted, and were put ink to get clocked on. It was first come first serve, unless you were one of the non-English speaking Mexicans, that was buddies with the guys in charge, if you showed up at 9am and 3 other people were in front of you there's a chance you may not get to clock on until 3pm, if it's a slow day, if it's raining for example. They would tell you you can't leave though, because they might need you, if it picks up. So you would literally sit and wait for hours on a plastic bench hoping they tell you to clock on. Even better, they might finally clock you on, then an hour later tell you to go take a 4 hour break, because it's dead again, but we'll need you around 8 to close so make sure you're here it didn't always play out like that, but was absolutely a possible scenario, that could occur on any given weekday. Weekends were typically pretty busy, unless it was raining there was no break room for us, there was just a plastic picnic table to sit on out in the sun, didn't even have a tarp over it to get out of the sun, when I was there. Last place I worked recorded employees non-stop audio and everything. They were constantly watching and listening in. One time a manager sent a text to my coworker saying I'm watching you from the toilet RN I guess to make sure we weren't doing anything bad, but it felt extremely disrespectful. Pretty sure it was legal, one party state, but it was creepy. My coworker said that they also take out your 30 minute break from your hours, even if you don't take it, or at least they did for him. A lot of times it would be too busy, and we wouldn't have time for breaks, especially because they are only allowed at certain times, and they would just assume you took one if you didn't clock out and remove that time. So unless you wrote your hours down on paper the ones in the system were up to owner discretion without notification. Speaking of schedules they had a tendency 
to completely change without any notice. I'd write down my entire schedule and make plans for the week and then wake up the next morning and it's completely different in the app we used. I put in my two weeks eventually, but on my last day, scheduled I was fired for making raspberry muffins instead of blueberry. Even though in training I was told I could make whatever faking muffins I wanted. Just astounding inconsistency in this respect. Every rule was pulled out of the manager's ass and not shared with other managers so there was constant conflict on what was okay and not okay to do and what our responsibilities. I guess that's what happens when a couple with zero restaurant experience opens up a franchise because they had the money. I just wanted to be treated fairly for my work and not have to constantly fight against management to be paid fairly. Rant over. Finally I've been waiting for somewhere to post this. It's very personal and pretty embarrassing, but here goes. I'm a female working at a travel agency which is super customer service related, and the schedule has zero flexibility. Well, I have vibes. This means that some days I could be late to work, have to leave early, but that is super rare and mostly just means I may have to spend an hour or more in the bathrooms on bad days. I do my best to keep my productivity up to standards, and I have two doctor's notes explaining the situation. Yes, my symptoms are bad enough that I've had a colonoscopy to rule other things out. My company's idea, I guess instead of firing me for a disease with no cure that I absolutely cannot control, was to cut my hour-long lunch down to 30 minutes. The other 30 minutes is to use throughout the day as needed for the bathroom literally word for word. Wait, what? Isn't this asking an employee to spend 30 minutes of their lunch break on the toilet? I feel extremely violated in several ways. Is this legal? Please help. Edit. I want to mention that I've only been with this company for two years. Prior to this, I was employed with one company for eight years with no issues whatsoever. So obviously, I can get my work done well. This isn't really a direct policy, but I need to get it off my chest. I was constantly being yelled at by my manager, getting papers yanked out of my hands. I was in the process of being trained in the warehouse, and when she had to be the second signature on shipments I sent out, she would reprimand me for things she, I wasn't taught to do yet, call me an idiot, throw the pen down on the desk and huff, while walking away one. I felt I was being emotionally abused which affected my work, and that snowballed to the point where I would cry in the bathroom nearly every day. I wear my heart on my sleeve, so it was really hard for me to talk to my boss about things. We didn't even have a human resources department. I decided it would be best to record an interaction between me and my manager so I could have evidence to send, rather than burst into tears trying to explain things to my boss myself. I was pretty sure this was legal in my state, so I turned on my phone's video, put it in my pocket, and recorded our interactions for one day. I got a lot of evidence, her calling me an idiot, raising her voice, cussing at me, getting mad for me asking questions and all the aforementioned one things. I sent the audio to my boss asking if they could bring this up with the higher ups. My boss was very apologetic and surprised at what they heard in the audio, saying that's unacceptable. They told me they would bring it up with the boss boss. A couple days later I was asked to come talk with them. I was basically told that recording conversations is illegal, I could be fired for this, and they'll talk with my manager. Halfway through that meeting I broke into tears. The way my boss boss was talking made it seem that he never even opened the audio file, which didn't help my case in the slightest. A week later I was fired, and my manager said, I tried to get you to work harder. Everyone I worked with, besides my manager, was surprised to hear that I was let go. I don't know what else to say. I later googled my state laws, and recording conversations is only illegal if I'm not an active participant in the conversation. So I was lied to, reprimanded for it, and, probably, nothing was done to fix the emotional abuse I was receiving. Not sure if illegal, but previous job did this. They had overstaffed it employees who were not properly trained. So I would say about 75% of them did not actually do their job well. They overstaffed in order to try and provide support, but it was a banded solution to a growing problem, rapidly expanding locations. 
their solution was to instead cap out their pay wherever they were at and create a new position title that performed the same work, but one person would instead cover two sites instead of just one site. If you wanted to be hired for the new position, you had to quit in order to apply. You could not move. You could not stay in your current position and apply. Only qualified people would fill the position, and it started at $2 more an hour than the capped out pay for the current position. $15 was cap, so the new job paid $17 starting, with benefits. Their reasoning for not being able to move anyone already in a current position was the new job could only be created if it was back quote non-budget impacting. It was their way of trimming the fat without firing anyone. I left the job and applied to the new one, but I also applied to my current job which is 200% better, currently paid 3 times more money and the benefits are much better. They called me back a week before I started my new job to offer me the position, and I said no thanks, I got another job. My place of work hosts one of the largest annual sporting events in the country, and in the four months or so leading up to said event we are all expected to turn up several hours early, leave several hours late, and skip lunch breaks in order to get everything done. We're all salary workers, and we don't get overtime, unsociable hours pay, or any other extra pay for doing this. When questioned, management's response well it's season, everyone has to pitch in. We also hold smaller events on about a monthly basis, some of which are on Saturdays. Certain staff are expected to work those Saturdays, days which usually run about 12 hours, with a single half hour lunch. Our contracts state we get a full hour, but management gets cheaty if we actually take that. They're also told that for every whole Saturday they work, they'll get back a half day holiday in lieu. So, work 12 hours, get 3.5 back in the form of a holiday you probably won't get to use. Oh, and the entire company is heavily discouraged from taking holiday from May to August, not to mention outright banned from taking it in June, because our summer event schedule is so tight, and we are so understaffed. This will probably get buried, but I'm a first year teacher. I felt pretty prepared going into the profession about the crazy hoops we have to jump through and the complete lack of compensation for the clearly expected overtime, but it's been interesting starting my career and talking to my mom, who has been in the private tech industry her whole career, about my job. When I moved into my classroom, there was 30 to sheety desks, a broken window, and a projector on a table. I had to find my way to two more desks to accommodate the number of students I have. I had to find a way to mount my own projector. I had to get my own staplers, whiteboard markers, organizers, and supplies, not to mention extra supplies for students who could not do the required work for my class without supplies that I provide because they cannot afford their own. When the question came up about asking the school for the supplies, everyone told me it was just easier to buy your own. If the school came through, which was highly unlikely, it would be sheety supplies that wouldn't last more than a month. Before school started, I put in at least 40 hours of unpaid work setting up my classroom just because it was what I had to do. My mom offered to help, and every time we went in I would bring more supplies. Every time she was shocked that I had had to buy my own, especially considering everything I was doing was off the clock anyway. I'm contracted to be at school from 7am to 2.30. My average day so far has been 6.30am to 4, and still I'm barely scratching the surface of teachers putting in overtime. I knew what I was getting into when I became a teacher. The years of shadow programs and student teaching gave me a good idea of the strains. It's funny to see it through my mom's eyes, a fellow professional who has never had to bring her own stapler to work. I'm one of the lucky ones my state is on the high end of compensation in the country, and as a young single person with no kids, my salary is pretty decent. But by every single calculation of what teachers get, paid by hour, that I have ever seen, I'm drastically underpaid. There is a clear expectation that I put in time for which I will never be paid, which in any other profession would be a clear case of unfair labor practices. And the common, resigned, expected attitude is well, that's just the way it is. Not my current job, but I worked at a drive-in that was built in the 60s. Hadn't really been updated till late 2000s, and when they did, they skimped on costs and labor. 
They certainly didn't bother just building from the ground up again, which they should have, because when it was originally built, the pipelines were all placed on a slight incline. Whose bright idea that was, I will never know. Anyway, over time, I'm sure you can imagine these backed up, pipes degraded, etc. At one point, you couldn't run two sinks at once, or pour too much out into a drain, because it would cause every drain, even the ones outside, to back up. I don't know about you, but working in ankle deep sewage water is not cool to me. Certainly not when I'm making people's food and drinks, the smell and fumes are making my co-workers ill. I can't even wear my shoes in my car because I've been trudging around in sheet water all day, etc. It got so bad that one day I had to go out and explain to a woman why there was literally log of sheet floating next to her car in drive through I brought the issue to my boss and the franchise owner. Not only did they say not to worry about it, they told us to stop washing our milkshake dishes after every shake and reuse them in order to cut back on the water issues. Mind you we make milkshakes that have all sorts of allergens in them and they are telling us to reuse things that have coconut, peanut butter, malt and the like on them. I got fed up and called the health department. Whenever we got investigated, they cornered me and asked if I was the one who called. I said yes, and that was my mistake, because after that they started retaliating by cutting my hours, being hostile, leaving me short-handed, or short-supplied on purpose. Then there was the time my other employer decided to have a contest, to see who could sell the most of a promotional item, restaurant. I was totally down for it until the results were posted, and not only showed numbers for the sales, but also how much in tips, wages, and taxes I had made year to date. They posted this in such a way, so the boss, because she wanted to prove to everyone how much better at her job she is, and how much harder she works than the rest of us, in plain view of customers and crew. I mean, that's probably not illegal, but I lost it. I'm a private Aish and frugal person, and don't discuss my money readily, so I was very miffed. And the one place where they took most of our hours causing us to only be able to have one person on at a time for more than 4 hours, and told us we are supposed to call in help, so we can take lunch and bathroom breaks, and I asked them to clarify they told me to call someone in for literally 5 minutes, while I took a leak, and they said yes, and if no one can come in then we have to wait until coverage gets there. We had someone who had to poop and lock the door and left a sign to the effect of back I'm 10 and got fired for it. Work in a children's home, UK, for autistic children. Now for safeguarding reasons we have to read the children's individual service plans in order to know what to do and what not to do. Now these ISPs are made up with information from the children's local authorities and must be followed for the safety of both children and staff. Now for the safety of staff a lot of children are to be staffed by two staff members, which is okay if you're on the day shift, however I work 12 hour nights, 10pm to 10am. Some of the children with their needs are awake when we arrive on site and can get very violent, had a lot of injuries. Now here's a problem. There's around 15 children who live here and on nights we are forced to be at a maximum of 1 to 1. The management refused to get sufficient staffing for the nights, and when the children are awake from 10pm onwards, and wake up at around 7am this causes a huge problem and danger. Management don't work any night shifts, and every time it's brought up in meetings, and by our union it gets ignored, and we are told it's fine. Despite the company being sued by staff multiple times due to incidents related to staffing. The sad part is that the place is also a school, meaning our governing board is Ofsted, and not the CQC, and Ofsted are fucking useless when you bring these issues up. TLDR, my workplace would rather leave staff in immediate danger and get sued than prevent this from occurring. This probably saves them money on staffing in the long run. Oh boy do I have a lot to contribute to this. I worked at a water park one summer where most of the employees were teenagers. It was a first job kind of place, and they took all kinds of advantage of people like me, since they expected us not to know better. For example, to clock out of shifts for breaks or to go home, you could either swipe your ID or punch in your ID number, which was visible on your ID. You had to wear this ID as a badge, so basically everyone could see your number. You can probably see where this is going. I always got a printout of my pay stubs, 
so I could make sure they didn't mess up. I figured I worked a lot of overtime and they might miss an hour here or there. No, they missed all of my overtime. It added up to over $100, which was a lot to me. As it turns out, my manager had been faking my hours by clocking me out while I was still working. That way, it looked like I was taking all my proper breaks and never had overtime. This was apparently the policy throughout upper management, but not all the way to the top. I reported it two hours. They actually helped, I got my money, and everyone else who had been cheated got this. The issue was that it came out that I had been the one to tattle. My two managers pulled me into the back one day to interrogate me and threaten me with firing. Luckily I stood my ground and knew my rights. Again, we were all teenagers, so they expected us to be clueless. I chose to stay since I needed the money, but they stopped threatening me. In another incident, as some sort of bizarre cost-saving measure, employees were no longer allowed to use the soda machines for water. There were water fountains throughout the park, but none could be accessed while you were on your shift, and as I previously alluded to, it was not uncommon to miss your breaks. Top that with the two facts that, due to fryers, open pizza ovens and other such appliances, it was always a minimum of 20 degrees hotter inside than outside, which they told us first day of work, and that where I'm from, most summer days are 90 degrees or hotter, and people were getting sick. Also, we weren't allowed to have our own containers, flasks, etc. We could only have water bottles. This was definitely illegal, since we were required to pay for water to avoid being sick while they could easily provide it. I have more stories from that water park, and some new ones, now that my younger brother works there, as I said, it's the first job place. I'm never going back. The place was a nightmare to work at. Edit, putting this at the top for visibility, this is complicated, and it's important, because this issue is not unique to one company. If you manage to read it all, or skip to the end there is ways for you to help I will discuss at the very end. A company I used to work for is doing illegal stuff now. Basically they are a durable medical equipment company, so oxygen, ICPAP, wheelchair etc. So let's see, a basic one is constant HIPAA violations, discussing patients medical records and information or just gossiping in front of other patients and whoever else they want. But the one that's actually a new policy is that, because last year Medicare cut their reimbursement by 50% for all the ME, now this is super faked up, because it means that when you set up a Medicare patient on oxygen you get paid $45 for stationary and like $25 for portable or something like that, rough estimates. But the company pays $400 for the stationary system, and if it's a portable concentrator they cost $1,200-$1,500, so right away you have to hope to rent these machines with no failures for nearly two years, just to recoup the cost of the equipment. But even if you take that completely out of the picture, Medicare has extremely strict rules to qualify someone for oxygen, meaning it can take days or even weeks to get proper paperwork and process it, then have it reviewed by a team meant to handle these orders, and then pay someone to drive to the patient's house and do the setup. All said and done it can easily cost over $100 $150 to set up a Medicare patient on oxygen regardless of what equipment they get just in wages and fuel, and not including the cost of the equipment or supplies. So if you set up a patient on brand new equipment it could cost you $2000 easily, which because you're always getting new patients it's pretty common to have to do this. Ok so what's illegal? This faker made me read a boring as novel, and didn't even breach the subject yet right. So this company I used to work for has decided to try and find a way around this by forcing Medicare patients to pay a premium cash price at set and every month after for their equipment and then make them submit to Medicare for reimbursement themselves so they will say this costs $150 a month and then you submit it to Medicare right except if Medicare pays them it will only be about half of what they paid but federal laws state that you cannot charge a patient for oxygen that is covered by Medicare and they will pay for outside of patient portions if the patient does not have secondary insurance. So it's actually illegal because they are charging the patient money and because they are charging them more than Medicare's reimbursement which is also part of that law. But wait there's more. 
Patients who had already been set up previously they are calling and telling them this is how it is now, and if the patient won't pay they are going and taking their portable oxygen system back. Meaning they can't leave their house now, but it's actually much much worse. Medicare also provides oxygen, based on a 5 year contract, DME providers only get paid for the first 3 years, and then have to provide equipment for free for 2 years, after which time the patient has to get a new prescription and their contract starts over. But, this means that a Medicare patient who has been in service with this company for about 1.5 years plus and just had their provider come take away their oxygen can't actually switch companies because they are locked in with this company for another 3.5 years. This is basically a protection racket like the Mayfair used to do, and gangs still do. They are demanding you pay cash now, and charging more money, when you don't pay up they take your equipment, and you don't have the option to change to a new company, because you are contracted with your current provider, meaning if you want to continue to have oxygen and yeah no, lift, you have no choice, but to pay their fee. To clarify, I no longer work for this company, I work for a competitor now, and we are actually doing all we can to help these poor patients, but sadly there isn't much we can do, because what we are doing is 100% free of charge, it's not much, just delivering portable oxygen tanks to these patients, so they can go to their doctor appointment, get groceries etc and sadly I've had to let them know it's not a permanent solution because well, my company doesn't know we are doing it, and we would for sure get fired for it, not because we are doing so much for free, but because what we are doing is also super illegal. Oxygen is a drug so basically we are giving people a drug without us having a prescription. Well and giving away so much for free too lol. The company has been reported, but until something is done about it, we can't just sit by knowing what's going on. In my edit at the top I mentioned a way all of you can help, and I do mean every person living in the United States. What that company is doing is illegal, and it is wrong, but they are doing it, because Medicare reimbursement has reached a point that you lose money providing for them. So while the company is handling it the wrong way, and is doing something truly inexcusable, it's not something they are doing for pure evil. This is an issue across the nation in the United States. Many DME companies are refusing to accept Medicare at all. Even my company will not provide wheelchairs, walkers and many other services to Medicare patients, because in some cases it costs more than double what Medicare pays to set them up. And this is exclusively elderly and disabled people who have no other option and are often on fixed incomes. We hate this, it hurts deep in your soul to deny someone access to the equipment that they need, it's unbearable. And we have it easy, we aren't the ones who need the equipment. So please if for some reason you made it this far, call and write your senators and congressmen, and tell them this must be fixed. Ask your friends and family to do the same, I know it's a pain, but if we all do this, and actually make a change it could help countless people all over the nation. I'm very sorry I majorly went off subject, but this is very important. I doubt many will see it at this point, but I hope all of you who do decide to take action. Thank you in advance. Edit 2. If you do please remember Medicare not Medicaid. They are very different and none of this applies to Medicaid. I work in a BSL-3 laboratory. My coworker was sick and didn't feel comfortable going in. This happens. Happened to me when I had strep throat, which got so bad my tonsils had a white coat on them for a week, but I didn't stand up for myself at that time like she is. She told our supervisor and safety officer ahead of time that she can still do 90% of her normal duties, but cannot suit up for a few days, and explained her medical issues, and then had to explain to two other bosses the same info. She was told to go get a medical consult, so she did she took sick time off to get a doctor's note, and even the doctor was saying, what the fuck am I writing a note for? My coworker just cannot wear proper PPE right now due to some sporadic asthma she has. While she's explaining this to me, all I can think about is that working around select agents is not something an organization can force someone to do, and, really, all my coworker wanted was just a week or so for her asthma to clear up. So she felt comfortable wearing an N95 slash PAPR before working with brucella, beanthrosis, eftalorensis, wipestis, etc. Edit, working with deadly BO agents is something one can opt out of, 
She was not doing that, just airing a temporary concern. She feels like she is being targeted by every supervisor now. Instead of working with her, she feels like supervisors are shutting her out and immediately questioning her dedication and reducing her job responsibilities. Again, all this happened in one week because she was upfront about an intermittent health issue she has. BTW, every goddamn form we make people fill out when we escort them into our lab, it's like hash 3 on the list after date and signature. Are you immune compromised? To top it all off. She was switched into this BSL3 lab from a genome sequencing position, without consultation, and now she's afraid she may not even keep the job she was forced into. Just because of a temporary health issue. It's especially faked up because our supervisor, until like 4 months ago, was a safety officer. Some bad juju is going on right here. My second ever job was with Smashburger, UK, and the advert for it claimed that, since the restaurant hadn't opened, yet that we would be able to decide whether or not we wanted part-time or full-time contracts, and how many hours we would like to do. We were told the same during the interview, and also told the same thing during training where we got to write down how many hours we would like on our contracts. Well, the day came when we signed our contracts. It was all very rushed, and we were all told explicitly to not read the contracts at the moment as we had a lot to get done, and not enough time, just sign them, and read them later. All of us but one did it, an older lady piped up where's the part on our contract about ours? Our boss went red, and looked around the room. That is when he informed us, that it was actually a zero hours contract, that we had all just signed, and they cannot guarantee how many hours we would actually be getting. I left the opening week, I did almost three times the amount of hours that I had asked for. My current job is a sheet out though, if you read the contract it basically has a list of all the workers rights you are signing away. You are not entitled to a break, ever. You may have to work more than 12 hours in a shift, I have seen people do 14 plus without a break. If you are off sick we will take a paid holiday off of you. If we cannot give you your contracted hours we will force you to take a paid holiday and we won't ask you about it either. Managers, salaried, will receive a percentage of tips, the same as the rest of us. There is no minimum amount of hours between shifts, I've had to come in 6 hours after a previous shift ended. It's not policy, but I've only received a single payslip off of them the entire 6 months I've been there. I have absolutely no idea why my pay fluctuates like it does, and I've tried bringing it up with all of my managers, but they've not done anything about my payslips yet. Also, not sure if it's illegal, but we are only allowed to have a single drink on shift, no matter how long it is, though the front of house like to sneak drinks into the kitchen when they can. I worked a job at a limo company detailing and cleaning all the limos and taking them out to get gas and regular maintenance. I was hired unknowingly as a subcontractor, which requires me to provide my own materials and optional uniform. I was required to wear the limo company uniform, and they provided my materials. I was paid hourly by the company, but the guy didn't want to pay the expenses and taxes of me being a legitimate employee. I was told otherwise, and had no idea. It was normal for me to work odd hours, late night to early morning by myself. One night I was alone doing my work and my manager, who also owned the place, came into the warehouse drunk as hell. I tried not to think anything of it, because I really needed the money. He passed out inside the car I was cleaning. I woke him up, and helped him into the office, where he could sleep it off, and tried to leave him, so I could go back to my work. He kept trying to get me to stay, and eventually tried to talk me into such. I felt so uncomfortable and secretly began recording the conversation on my phone. When I told him I wasn't interested, he got angry and offended. He then locked all the doors and I immediately was scared. I literally had to race him to my car, parked in the warehouse, and jumped in as fast as I could. I locked all my doors and he freaked out trying frantically to open my doors. He beat his fists on the car and called me every name under the sun. I tried to drive away through the only bay door in the warehouse. He was faster than me and drove a limo in front of the door to block it. Or Lex it's blocked. I panicked and called 911. The cops came and I let them listen to the recording. They heard everything. 
but they couldn't lock him up because I was technically able to leave the premises through one unlocked door, I just wasn't able to drive away. They wanted to bag him so bad, but they said they couldn't. I was confused and thought of it as legal kidnapping. But the guy was smart and knew all the loopholes. I was sure he's done this before, preying on young naive girls. I was 18. He kept my last paycheck and refused to give it to me. I could have taken him to small claims court for it, but honestly I was so afraid to even see him again that I just let it go and tried to put it behind me. I have no idea where he is now, but I hope he's behind bars somewhere rotting away. Biggest scumbag I've ever met. I dreamt about physically beating him to death for a long time. Wasn't a job but it still fits. My university was a campus uni and had somehow managed to get the emergency services, in particular ambulances to refuse to come up if a student rang them directly. It was basically common knowledge amongst us students that if someone needed urgent care you had to first contact our campus watch staff, which were essentially a team of graying, pot-bellied blokes who would interrogate you to see if you really needed them before they even came out. You then had to wait for them to arrive, they honestly never showed any haste, and then they could decide whether the person in question needed an ambulance or not. I have two examples of how this policy or essential lack of trust in students seriously affected and in one case endangered someone life. The first was a story passed on about a lad injuring himself in the sports hall. Apparently he snapped some bone in his leg, was in complete agony, but the ambulance didn't arrive for three hours. The students involved had rung directly, and because he wasn't bleeding out, and it had been a call made by the students themselves it wasn't a priority. The lad world been better to get someone to drive him in but instead had to wait. I totally understand that we don't always have ambulances available. I'm from the UK, and that if calls come in for more urgent and life-threatening issues they will be diverted but it still seems pretty outrageous, and we were all told it's because campus watch weren't involved. I was skeptical until I had first-hand experience myself. Roll on towards the end of my first year. Sun's out, everyone is at the pub drinking and pretending we don't have essays due in or exams to revise for. I've been told one of my mates is unwell in her house, which is why she is missing, but I don't think much of it as we've recently argued, and she can be very dramatic at times. Anyway, her housemate and another mate of mine appears in the beer garden looking worried and comes up to me and basically begs me to come back with him to check on my friend. I don't want to go as I'm drinking with friends, but he seems really concerned, so I go with him, and and on the way he explains the girl in question has collapsed in front of him and has been in bed all day unable to move. I'm skeptical but when I get there and go into my mate's room it's clear she's unwell. She's completely white, sweating and can barely speak to me. I ask her what her symptoms are, I'm not medically trained at all but obviously needed to know roughly what was going on, and she says her stomach is severely cramping, she's been unable to hear or drink, she's collapsed twice and the pain she's in is almost unbearable. Due to us all basically being indoctrinated by this call campus watch, before anyone else mantra I get the housemate to call them whilst I try to sit my friend up, so we can attempt to go to our on-site nurse. Moving makes her vomit, lose consciousness briefly, and cry out in more pain so all I do is help her put a top on and some trousers then lay her back down. By this point I'm seriously concerned because I can't move her myself and we push campus watch to come round as we know an ambulance will not come to us if we call direct. He takes forever, asks a million questions when he arrives and speaks to us like we're being dramatic. I'm having none of this, and I say she needs medical attention as she can't move for being sick and or collapsing. He calls 111, non-emergency line, and my friend has a phone handed to her and has to explain her symptoms. They say they'll send out a first response unit 45 minutes later he arrives. I'll listen to the same palaver again, the endless questioning, pushing the have you been drinking over and over until he finally decided she might need an ambulance, after trying to make her stand up, and seeing exactly what I had witnessed and explained already. Even with a member of emergency services staff there it took about hour and a half for an ambulance to arrive, and at this point my friend was catatonic from pain in myself, and her housemates were beyond worried. Ambulance arrives, try to make her move. 
she made a noise that haunts me to this day, awful, guttural animal wailing from the pain, this is because I still didn't think there was much wrong and wanted her to walk down the stairs and out of the house herself when she couldn't even sit up, eventually carry her out whilst whining about it taken away and I have to call her mum who lives about 2 hours away and explain she's on her way to hospital and we don't know what's wrong with her. Find out later she had an incredibly rare double ectopic pregnancy, lost an ovary as one of her fallopian tubes basically exploded, lost that much blood from internal bleeding it was touch and go and can't remember any of it. All of this would have been lessened if they just trusted students a little more and saw what was in front of them. Long post but it really stayed with me that my friend almost died. My first company I worked for set up a new training system me being one of the guinea pigs along with four others. This would require us to work under other staff members w slash o getting paid anything and still be expected to do what a played employee does. One day the leadership who was looking after the trainees changed and we had someone who for the most part, more organized this meant we were given pointers and how to improve better and having workshops. Now to understand none of the trainees worked on the same day as each other so, although some of us were friends we didn't talk much about work. However I had been being trained for a year which for someone young to have no income and invest in a job so long I was getting impatient. I ended up talking to two of the other trainees who told me they were fully trained now and getting paid which confused me since I thought we were all being trained at the same rate. This continued on for a while as the employee said I would be finished training soon. Came from multiple people. So I decided I'd wait it out. I waited another 5 months before I got fed up and said I was going to quit and leave for another job which a friend had offered me because I wasn't getting paid. Turns out when management switched over they forgot I was in training, and whilst everyone else had been fully employed 6-8 months ago I was being and paid for almost the same work. It was a rough time without money and I ended up getting paid later on, but never for the 17 months of training. I started working the other job, and then quit where I was working 2 months later, since the new job paid, and when I was getting paid at better rates. My last job was horrible. I worked at a private school in Canada. Private schools follow some of the rules of public schools and the public school boards, but not all. They had their own set of rules for things, and if you didn't follow them, you got in big trouble. I'll start with the first problems I noticed. The bus drivers were paid under the table. They were contracted bus driver to drive branded buses around the area to pick up kids. Most parents had to drop their kids off at designated stops, which included McDonald's and Tim Hortons locations. All of us were paid which checks, though they were paid with cash. The school advertised licenses teachers, though some on the elementary level, that I knew, were not licensed in my province. I specifically worked in the after school program. We had no funding, and no classroom for our kids. We were given the cafeteria. Halfway through the year, they added 20 more kids to our program, bringing our totals of kids aged 3, 6 to over 30, and our kids aged 7, 12 to 20. We had 4 adults. They also took our cafeteria space and gave us two 10x10 rooms to house 50 kids. It was dangerous, and since I left the school I've been hearing nothing but bad things about their summer camps and other stuff. There is more I could go into, and I've always considered going to the police, but I don't know if it's the right thing to do. I keep seeing these call labor board and such comments. Let me tell those willing to read that does absolutely nothing. I have worked for a guy that literally posted on the bulletin board. Hourly employees are not to work more than 40 hours a week. Hourly workers will not receive overtime pay for any hours over 40. No exceptions. The boss regularly bones PPL for pay. I had proof in form of paychecks not adding up. Pictures of these type of notices and the depth of labor blew me off. The paycheck literally shows 81 plus hours straight time. Everyone in my county gets screwed on the last paycheck. Another employer will either A. Not send last check. My rumored and I never received. Or B. Lower your pay rate on final check. He did this to our acting chef because chef walked, and this guy was still hourly from $14 slash HR to minimum wage, at, dollar sign, 7, dot 25 slash hour, I've spoken with many people. 
about my county being immune to these labor laws and everyone just nods in agreement. There is a little short order place that has been here since before I was born, and they pay military dates, that is 7th and 27th or something vs every two weeks. Somehow they never pay out over time either. When I do the math and check laws it seems they are breaking them, but the paper trail and time spent on the phone isn't worth sheets to the depth of labor. As far as I'm concerned the depth of labor is a faking hoax and no one actually works there. I worked at a Berkram and Fitch in their home office when I was in high school. My job was to fold clothes after the models had worn them for the photo shoots and they also had mock storerooms that they would set up and photograph for all of the stores to use as a guide when setting up their shelving and displays. We would fold them and put them on shelves in a warehouse that was used to fulfill online orders. My work uniform was to wear a Berkram B clothes and certain brands of shoes that they dictated. I was forced to buy their clothes without compensation, and anyone who ever shopped at a Berkram B circa 2015 knows that their prices were ridiculous, especially for a high school student. If I showed up to work wearing any other brand, I would get yelled at. We were also not allowed to have breaks, and more than a couple restroom visits in one shift would get you into hot water. On a side note that isn't illegal, but is jacked up, this was at the end of Mike Jeffrey's reign of terror as the CEO. Any time he left his office and walked through the building, we would all have to hide and shut off the lights because he would fire any employee that he saw. The man thought he was a god. One of my friend's mom was his personal assistant for a short time, and she was miserable. She had some crazy stories. Overall that company was a miserable place to work, although I'm not sure how it is today, since I quit the company around the same time Mike Jeffers was forced to step down. I got a letter this year informing me that there is a class action lawsuit against the company for forced patronage and labor violations, but I chose not to join in on it because I did not work there for long and only bought a couple pairs of clothes, so it wouldn't be worth the hassle to me. I also worked at Taco Bell for two years and had some issues. My hours would always be changed in the system so they could save money by paying me less and they would send me home early all the time to keep the labor percentage low. Sometimes I would show up to work and they would send me home after half an hour. As an employee I got 50% off of one order on the days that I worked. The really annoying part was that they would limit me to $10 worth of food before the discount. I was just a kid and didn't realize some of these things are illegal, plus it's in the past, so I don't let it bother me. Many at the old job. We were all casual even guys working 45 hour weeks. Often breaks were interrupted by customers or cut short by a sales rep or order arriving. Would be written up by the owner if you didn't do the work, even if you were on break no making the time up yourself at all. Once I was working and was told to finish early, but because I hadn't had a break, yet he wanted me to take 30 minutes before going home then I ended up being in trouble for not answering the storeroom phone. No leave, no overtime rate, still paid regular wage and extra time though, offset by being paid a bit above going rate. No warning for overtime, expected to simply stay until he said you are good to go, will be in trouble for not being a team player if you leave. Impossible to deal with regarding roster, as he didn't make them I did, but regularly in trouble for not doing them how he wants. Tries to tell me, when we have too few available to just tell them they'll be sacked if they done, arrive to work with 20 minutes warning our bullshit boss not happening. Credit card fraud happened a couple of times, refuses to cooperate with police, because they didn't follow up shoplifting well enough for him. Had an attempted robbery, I called the cops, was told off by the boss, because we had closed doors for about an hour, while they got fingerprints and statements refused to give them CCTV, unless they purchased a USB. Carried on that the lady in charge, was a man-hater, said women should not be allowed to be in charge of work anywhere. Incredibly sexist, homophobic and racist, rips resumes up, and never has hired one female or person of color will base all his business decisions with reps on their attractiveness, so they come back to the store more regularly. Expected all the staff to come in on our days off when doing renovations, to help to keep the tradesman costs down with the suckers, who did it being well underpaid. Always forgets to pay holiday penalties until confronted. Docs staff pay for damaged items. It goes on and on. 
I worked a seasonal job, was laid off in April, and went on EI, where I'm from to receive employment insurance, EI, you have to prove to them that you're actively looking for work. I was a cook at my seasonal job. In June my boss called me in for a 3 hour shift. All she said was wear comfortable clothes because you're helping maintenance pull the cage out of basement storage. Again. I'm a cook. Maintenance is a completely different entity. They are unionized we are not. Turns out I had a few interviews lined up for that day anyway and wasn't available. I told my boss she said that's not really an appropriate excuse I assured her it was because right now EI is paying me under the condition that I look for work. She felt that her staff should be at her beck and call all summer for short, unrelated to our position, BS work. I got fired via mail in June while I was laid off, the reason was because I was not dedicated enough to the job to be available for that shift. I'm quite sure that was illegal. Edit spelling. This might actually be illegal is definitely illegal. TLDR. Seasonal employee regularly working hot and employer doesn't want to pay. Tells us to just add them as regular hours after our summer season ends. We were locked out of the time clock and couldn't do it. I worked a seasonal park and rec summer job and was hired part time. We weren't allowed to go over 39.75 hours a week because we were part time. This was before all the part time slash full time stuff happened. We always went over 39.75 hours because we worked summer day camps that were just shy of 8 hours long and we had to get there early slash stay late to sign kids in and out. Anyway, for the most part we couldn't flex it off because there'd be nobody to watch the kids. So our employment would end like August 15th or whatever the last week was before school. Our employer was like, okay, so if you worked 80 hours extra over the summer just clock two full time weeks after camp ends on August 15th. Because they didn't want us to be full time, or pay us overtime. They'd rather pay us until August 30th at regular, not not pay. So August 15th rolls around, and then we are not in the system anymore, because we were seasonal summer employees. Like we couldn't log in to clock those hours. I was already, justifiably, mad about some other stuff, so I never pursued it. I don't think it was my direct supervisor's fault, though she never stood up for us to my knowledge, but rather the pressure and constraints she had placed onto her. I haven't surged 300 bucks you have to start coughing up money. It's not my fault their system is so sheet that it's super easy to fuck up account. Also, you work from 630 to 245. You get 15 minutes out to do papa work it takes most 30 minutes to a hour to do, so you don't get out till 3, 330, but you don't get paid for it. Breaks aren't guaranteed or timed. Some days I didn't even get to take a break, still make same amount, because it was just car after car and domo we pump the gas. Whole system there is faked. You're basically told to lie to customers. Push the 241 water it's 141.05 or 242.15. How do I morally try to push water to people? Same with chips and sheet. None of it is actually a deal. No one wants this faking sheet. How do you expect me go sell $300 of chips that we don't faking have? One lady asked for one kind. Sorry, after the fourth different kind I said we didn't have she just said never mind. That job sucked for 13 bucks a hour throw away. Because stuff. I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, you cannot treat contractors and temps as employees. Aka, give them benefits, raises and the like, if they are being given by the company. I used to work in the business slash finance industry. So ended up for sheets and giggles going through a temp agency got the job that had to do nothing with my background. I was given a job description and a place to work, and they changed what my job entailed, and where it was being held. Like inviting a janitor into a meeting between all the C-suites, CEO, CFO, etc. Long story short I was invited into their meeting, and now I know all their forecasted profits, the losses, what they made in the current year and what they lost. Stock forecasts too. All their secret projects, that they are intending to make that will crush the competition. The improvements they made on mistakes in the past and improvements they made that no one even knew about. Every improvement they made in their labs and warehouses, stores, etc. 
things that they are never going to fix, also every single thing that they have extremely wrong right now that and I quote, we won't fix these till people actually start complaining. Imagine leading lobster as an example. Now I know about corruption and corporation fuckery, but to hear it out loud. It's like thinking you know, and then actually finding out the truth. The truth that you don't want to believe. To add, misogyny, sexism, and racism was also rampant. Also, it is a Fortune 500. I would take aliens and anything else over companies screwing over the human race. Edited.